Hi everyone. So I will start this presentation. So I will make a presentation today uh, about solving large linear systems, uh, especially with parallel solvers based on uh, runtime systems. So I'm Florent Pruveau, I'm engineer at INRIA uh, in the Bordeaux Center. I will first present uh, the general context, then uh, focus on uh, three uh, of the solvers we developed at INRIA, Chameleon, Plastix, and Mafis. So first, the context. So these solvers are developed uh, in the HIPAX INRIA team at uh, Bordeaux in a strong uh, collaboration with, with a close collaboration with the STORM team uh, Donc, so with uh, the team of Samuel Thibault that presented uh, StarPU uh, before. Um, so they work on parallel algorithms for numerical simulations and more especially on linear algebra. So they want to, to implement code uh, using sequential task flow algorithm. So we have some loops like this with sequential tasks or parallel tasks, which are submitted to a runtime system. So this, this submission of task uh, gives a direct acyclic graph of tasks. And then we submit this to a runtime system whose job is to schedule and decide where the task have to be scheduled uh, from really simple uh, systems like uh, my, my laptop until a system really complex that can be heterogeneous, uh, like large supercomputers using uh, several nodes uh, and possibly with GPUs. The main goal and the accent here is really to get good performances uh, on a wide uh, range of machines and um, to, to, to get a good scaling of the performance. So the solvers uh, we'll uh, present today are Chameleon first for dense matrix. So it's a dense matrix solvers, meaning it uh, works with dense matrices. So it performs operation like BLAS, LAPAC, uh, but in parallel. So it's a cousin to scale LAPAC, uh, but it has the ability to use runtime system uh, to perform uh, these operations uh, over uh, hundreds, uh, possibly hundreds of nodes and, and with the ability to, to use heterogeneous nodes. So it performs uh, like uh, matrix matrix uh, multiply, uh, solving linear systems, square roots problems, icon value problems in dense. Second, we have Pastix. So it's a sparse matrix direct solver. So, sorry. So the goal here is to solve uh, linear systems AX equal B using factorization techniques. So we factorize the matrix and then solve with triangular solve the system. Uh, so we, get, we can use Cholesky and LU decomposition of the matrices, depending on the properties. Uh, and then last is MAFIS. It's a, a sparse matrix hybrid solver, hybrid uh, in the sense that uh, it's a coupling between uh, iterative methods uh, for solving the system and direct methods. So in fact, it's, uh, it relies on a domain decomposition technique uh, to split uh, the general matrix in some subsystems on which we will apply some uh, direct sparse solver on the local system, uh, compute a short complement on uh, an interface system on which uh, we will uh, apply uh, an iterative technique using CG uh, or GMRS and to accelerate the convergence uh, of this interface problem. We use a preconditioner that, that rely also on uh, factorization in sparse or in dense of the short complements matrices. So, I'm talking about also runtime system. We use runtime systems uh, in our solvers. So I present here uh, fast two, two, two of them. First one is StarPU. Flo, your, your mic is down. Can you reopen it?
still off for me. Yeah. Your mic appears to be on, but we can't hear you. Okay, Florent is reconnecting. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes, yes, you're back. Okay, share screen. Okay, strange. Yeah. Bug. Yep, we can see your screen. Go ahead. Okay, nice. So um, I, I was presenting the runtime systems we can use. So first, RPU, which is developed uh, in, in RIA Storm Team. Uh, StarPU can use dynamic task uh, discovery. Uh, it provides C, C++ uh, and Fortran interface. It can handle MPI plus thread um, parallelism. And we can uh, use CUDA also uh, kernels uh, as well as OpenCL ones. They, they, can, uh, they offer multiple scheduling strategies like minimum completion time, local work stealing, or user defined. We can also compute the cost model on the fly so that uh, we can get uh, better precision uh, in the scheduling. Then there is Parsec, it's another runtime run system uh, developed at ICL, University of Tennessee, that rely on parameterized task graph, some different technique. Um, also, it's the same thing, it's a C, C++, Fortran interface, MPI thread, CUDA, and their scheduling strategy is more based on static performance model. So the advantage of using task-based runtimes are that uh, we can uh, expose several computing kernels that are associated with the task. So in C uh, or CUDA, for example, and then the runtime will execute the task graph on the available resources. So depending on whether you have or not GPUs, it will choose to schedule or not uh, GPUs kernel. And depending on the, on the fact, uh, to, to, it's really to minimize uh, the CPU time uh, in the end. So it can address the world computing unit and the world potential parallelisms, insulates the algorithm from the architecture and data distribution. So the goal here is to, to get a really uh, algorithm at a high level that really uh, focus on mass and that will uh, hide in fact uh, all what is uh, related to parallelism uh, and uh, specificity about architectures like CUDA and so on. We we'll get an automatic handling of data transfers also so it's, uh, it has the ability to automatically handle what is a transfer of data between nodes and uh, GPUs, and we'll get a finer parallelism handling. So concerning the software development quality, uh, it's, all the solvers are open source. They are hosted uh, at uh, GitLab in RIA in the group SolverStack. It's freely available uh, on this uh, on the page SolverStack uh, on this GitLab. You have Chameleon, Plastics, Mafis. We are trying to follow a good uh, development practices uh, with continuous integration. So each time we have develop, uh, modification on the branches and we push this on the new branches, uh, we will trigger some uh, build jobs, test jobs, and coverage. We are also uh, performing some uh, code analysis, static and dynamic code analysis to measure the quality of the source code with sonar cube, clang static analyzer, CPP check. And finally, we are also trying to perform some non-regression tests about performances uh, by uh, using some jobs once a week on our local supercomputer, Plafrim. And we try to, to display these uh, results uh, every week on our documentation. Concerning the software distribution, um, you can directly by yourself uh, install the dependencies with binary packages. For example, here on Ubuntu 20, you can install all what is CMake, uh, GCC, uh, the Intel MKL to get uh, LAPAC kernels, Scotch for the graph partitioning, StarPU to get a runtime system, and then install uh, one of the solver uh, like this. So you can download directly a tarball for a release or rely on the master branch uh, states directly by cloning the Git project. And you can build with CMake. We also provide the packages for two package managers, uh, which are uh, more and more uh, used in the HPC community. So we provide packages for SPAC, for the supercomputers that uh, 
that use it, or for GNU Geeks. Uh, so it's additional packages that are not in the official package. So you have to download something and to, to set up a bit uh, a configuration file. And then you can easily install uh, the solver by simple command lines. Um, for uh, the reproducibility, we definitely uh, recommend GNU Geeks because it's uh, more robust to reproduce an installation. So let's start uh, presenting Chameleon a little bit. So here's the software ecosystem. So it relies on kernels, Lapaki, Seblas, and Kublas if you want to use GPUs. And you have a choice between different runtime systems, depending whether or not you want to use GPUs or, or different nodes with MPI. So for instance, with OpenMP and Quark, uh, these runtime systems are limited to shared memory. If you want to use GPUs and uh, distributed memory, you should uh, build with Parsec or StarPU. MPI and CUDA are optional dependencies. You, are not, uh, you can directly use Chameleon on a shared memory machine without GPUs or, or MPI. So it's a C program uh, using CMake. The, it provides a Fortran interface. There are different kinds of algorithms. It's a bit, it offers, in fact, the, feature, the features of uh, LEPAC, something really similar. But the function will be uh, prefixed by Chameleon underscore. Uh, GEM, POTRF, GETRF, to call uh, matrix matrix multiplication, Cholesky, LU, QR factorization, and other algorithms uh, about eigenvalue problems and uh, least square problems. So, matrix uh, can be general, symmetric, Hermitian, triangular. Uh, we can have different pre uh, arithmetic precisions, simple, double, complex. Under the hood, here is an example of a tax based uh, Cholesky. So the global matrix is decomposed uh, and split into tiles. It's a sub-block uh, of the matrix. And we will call kernels, uh, sequential kernels, to work on these sub-data, sub, uh, sub-piece of data on the tiles. And these kernels can be uh, of type CPU or GPU. We will submit the task to the runtime system like this in a sequential task graph. Uh, so here an example. First, we will submit a POTRF so it's a Cholesky decomposition over the diagonal uh, block, the first diagonal block. Then we can submit several TRSM, which can be computed in parallel thanks to the POTRF. Then a CIRC and some gem to update the trailing matrix. All these tasks are submitted and can be run in parallel. As you can see, in fact, when we call this task submission uh, this um, work, in fact, is completely asynchronous. It's just a call to submit a task. It is a runtime that will really execute the task. So this loop is really fast uh, to be performed, to be executed. And then at the end of the loop, we, we should add um, a sort of MPI barrier, a task barrier, to say, OK, I want to wait at this, uh, at this location for all the tasks to be completed, and so that I want that my overall POTRF is over. I know that after this line, I can continue and that my matrix uh, is factorized. Here are, are examples of performance uh, of Chameleon on uh, oxygen nodes. So it's a uh, generalist homogeneous nodes here. We perform uh, matrix matrix multiplication uh, on uh, matrices that are larger and larger on several nodes. So we can see that uh, here we show the performance in terms of teraflops per second. So it's a number of operations per second. So we compared uh, this uh, performance in comparison with the theoretical peak, which is computed with, uh, in fact, uh, the performance of a gem, of an Intel MKL gem on one core. And we multiply this performance by the number of resources, so without overhead. So it's a flat line, it's our ref reference. And we uh, we perform then our parallel gem with Chameleon and we compare. We can see that uh, we, we are uh, something like 80% of the, of the theoretical peak here on one, two, four nodes. It's the same thing with more nodes and larger matrices. And we can get rather good performances uh, even with hundreds of nodes. We already have done um, performance uh, experiments with gem and POTRF on uh, like 500 of nodes on matrix size of 1 million. And it was uh, scaling uh, pretty well. 
Another example with uh, Cholesky here. So we compare chameleon uh, with um, Scalapac. So in homogeneous here, without GPUs, uh, chameleon can outperform Scalapac uh, on a POTRF here. And uh, comparing with a serious concurrent, which is Deplasma, which is also an, another uh, parallel linear solver for dense matrices, but using Parsec runtime system. Uh, we can see that it is completely competitive in homogeneous and also in heterogeneous using several GPUs. So one important thing to understand here is also that using algorithm on top of task-based uh, runtime system, we can in fact pipeline several algorithms. So instead of, for example, submitting one algorithm like Trulesky factorization, wait for the completion of all tasks, then submitting another task-based algorithm, and each time waiting for the completion of this specific algorithm, we can, in fact, uh, completely change all these algorithms together. And because we talk with the same runtime system, it, it has the information of the dependency of tasks. So we can, we can win a lot of time by uh, pipelining the algorithm. So now let's talk about Pastix, uh, short focus. So Pastix is the same ecosystem as Chameleon, but you will add uh, dependencies to the uh, graph partitioners like Metis, MPT Scotch or Scotch. It's also uh, written in C with Fortran, Python, Julia interfaces. It can solve LU, Cholesky factorizations, uh, and triangular solve. Uh, it handles general symmetric emission matrices. The storage formats are compressed sparse column, compressed sparse row, EG values. Uh, it also provides some low-rank compression techniques uh, that we can apply on the subtasks, on kernels. Uh, so the normal uh, version is to use, you know, uh, LAPAC or BLAS kernels. So it's uh, dense kernels on the tasks that we submit to the runtime, but we can in fact replace these kernels by uh, low rank compression ones uh, that leads to sometimes um, optimize the CPU time and the memory consumption also, depending on the cases and on, on the precision you want also. So under the hood, the general approach is as follows. Uh, we rely on the structure of the overall matrix uh, we compute uh, partitioning of this structure with a nested dissection using, for example, PT Scotch. Uh, it exhibits uh, some parallel blocks uh, weakly coupled, uh, and we will use this uh, parallel uh, structure to perform uh, some, uh, some of the tasks in parallel. So the algorithm is really similar to the Cholesky I just showed with, in the dense solver. We have to we have to to factorize first with the Cholesky or LU the diagonal block. Then we can solve the off diagonal blocks in the current column with TRSM kernels. Then updates the trailing submatrix with GEM. Uh, but here the thing is because we are not in dense, it's in sparse, so it's much more irregular. We have blocks of different sizes, uh, and we have many many blocks uh, split into the memory, so it's more difficult problem to solve, really. Um, the, the update of the trailing matrix can be done in several ways. Uh, we could perform a single big task, parallel task to update all the data at once with a big gem, or we can exhibit parallelism uh, by using, uh, we'll say, 1D updates. So performing the update by columns like this, by block of columns, so is being a task, he another task to update the subsequent blocks of columns. And this can be done in parallel. So we, we will call here 1D updates. And we can also, uh, depending on the case, apply 2D updates, a bit like in Chameleon, where we update the gem on the small blocks. This will be, uh, in fact, uh, some choices directly inside Pastix, uh, depending on the elimination tree, depending on the size of the blocks it can exhibit, it will choose the best uh, strategy when the or to the updates. Here is an example of performances on an heterogeneous node with uh, two or four uh, K40 GPUs. So it's several uh, matrices that come from the literature and we 
look at the performance in gigaflop rate. Uh, in red, we have the performance with uh, CPUs only, and then using one or more K40 uh, GPUs. As you can see, uh, the performance are better with GPUs, so we can get used, we can use the, the GPUs. Um, but of course, because the problem can be irregular and more complex to solve, sometimes the matrices are too small or it exhibits too small uh, sub-blocks so that it's really difficult to exploit uh, well the GPUs. So sometimes it's not better to use GPUs on some matrices. Let's talk about MAFIS now. Uh, MAFIS is uh, the hybrid solver. So it relies on uh, CG GM res iteration and also uh, factorization using sparse direct solvers that can be PASTIX or MIMS. It also uses uh, Scotch, PT Scotch to uh, compute the domain partitioning of the matrix. And it relies also on uh, LAPAC, uh, BLAST, MPI, and threads. So it can use several levels of parallelism. Either uh, we decompose the matrix uh, in sub subdomains and we use one MPI processor per subdomains and we bind it to a core. So each core being a subdomain of our problem. And then we will use, in fact, sequential PASTIX or sequential MIMS or on each subdomain and sequential LAPAC to, to factorize uh, some dense uh, matrices. Or we can also uh, try different strategy like uh, affecting uh, only uh, one MPI process per node and use uh, uh, multi-threading inside the node. So decompose less subdomains, decompose our global matrix in a fewer number of subdomains, but exploiting parallelization of PASTIX or MIMS at the multi-thread uh, level. And also exploiting, for example, multi-threaded uh, LAPAC like, like uh, Intel MKL on the dense matrices we will, uh, we will get. So it's written originally in Fortran uh, 80. It offers a C interface. Uh, they are currently working, the developers, on a modern C++ rewriting of the code. So for now, it's a work in progress and it's a private project. But uh, I think in a couple of months or years, uh, we will get this uh, open and freely available. Um, and the storage format is EG value. So under the hood, it's uh, based on domain decomposition techniques. So you have, let's say, a global uh, domain uh, or geometry that you, on which you want to solve uh, like a PDE, a partial differential equation system. You will try to, 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 to make a rise some parallelism. You will decompose this general problem into sub-problem omega, one, two, three, four, with boundaries between some domains. Uh, you will be able to solve uh, local systems in parallel, and you will have iterations between a system, some local systems that can be performed in parallel, and some binary problems uh, to solve the entire problem uh, then at convergence. MAFIS, the idea of MAFIS is to do that, in fact, at the algebraic level. So it does the domain decomposition, but just using the global matrix information. Not using, uh, we'll see, we we'll say the um, the equation, the continuous equation information. So the decomposition is as follow. We partition uh, the, the structure of the matrix uh, in subdomains uh, with local system uh, with interior and interface unknowns. It is computed with PT Scotch, or the user can directly provide the domain composite decomposition it already have. Then we perform a direct sparse factorization to factorize the local subsystems in parallel using uh, MIMS or PASTIX. The sparse direct solver will also give us a short complement uh, on each local system. This short complement uh, is a dense matrix. Thanks to the different short complement, we can, in fact, uh, arise a, a global sure uh, problem with a sure global matrix. Uh, this problem at the interface with a sure a complement matrix will be solved uh, using an iterative technique like CG or GMRES, depending on the properties of the Shure complement. And uh, because it can be very slow to converge, we use, of course, a preconditioning techniques. That is a factorization of uh, local Shure complement. So it's a, it's a diagonal block preconditioner based on factorization of Shure complements. 
of uh, local systems. So either we can use a dense LAPAC to factorize these shore blocks, or we could also uh, have techniques like uh, sparsify the shore blocks, uh, meaning uh, we drop some values that are too slow, uh, too, too, too few, uh, really low uh, variables. Uh, and then it becomes a sparse matrix that we can factorize with a sparse direct solver. So here are some examples of uh, performance. So here is CPU time depending on different test cases. It's a weak scaling. So it's CPU time and where we, we have a larger number of resources that are used and with a larger matrices. So normally the best uh, here to get is to have a flat uh, line. So here, because it's domain decomposition method, it's well known that uh, when we use many, many, many subdomains like here, we will have some convergence issues. Uh, so uh, the overall time will be will increase because we will uh, need more iterations to to converge. But we are able to to perform this on really large system. But we can see that in some cases, because we have some good uh, preconditioning techniques involving uh, core space corrections. We can uh, drastically limit, in fact, this bad behavior and uh, limit the convergence problem. It depends on the test case. Another example here, it's a strong um, scalability example. On the plasma propulsion uh, here example, we compare the domain decomposition technique used in MAFIS with an algebraic multigrid method, which is a concurrent, natural concurrent for domain decomposition methods. So we multigrid in Petsy. So we can see that, of course, because this iterative method uh, doesn't like a uh, situation where there are too, too, too many de decomposition, and when we use too many cores and uh, nodes, uh, we cut a lot our system and we can have convergence issues and then CPU times can uh, can be worse, but what is interesting to note here to notice is that even if on small cores the algebraic multigrid method will be better than the domain decomposition with MAFIS, we can have here some situation when if you use uh, enough number of cores, uh, we can show that uh, in fact the domain decomposition will outperform algebraic multigrid method. So here, no need to take more than 1,000, for example, cores on this example. So my presentation uh, here is finished. So now I will show you um, how we can use these solvers uh, on a supercomputer. So here is a link of a web page uh, I have prepared for the tutorial. So I will try to send it to you, the link in the chat. Have you received uh, the link? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. So um, the goal here is to, to show how to, to use uh, these solvers, to show example of usage of these solvers on a real uh, supercomputer. So here we will use Plafrim, which is uh, our local supercomputer. But uh, of course, you can try to, to use it on national uh, computer, like, uh, like Terra, or Oxygen, or Oak, or what you want, or BSC at Barcelona. We already have made experiments on these clusters. So first, a short word about GNUGIX. So GNUGIX will be used here to install the softwares. So I talk about it because it can really ease uh, the installation of the software in a reproduci reproducible way. So GNUGIX is already installed on Plafrim, so it's also a chance for us. So key features are reproducibility. You can get really the same code on, over your laptop or on the cluster. You will not rely on existing module. And so maybe get different, different behavior because you use uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, versions of your dependencies. Uh, it is versatile. You can use this tool as a package manager. It uh, provides container uh, solutions. Uh, tran transactional upgrades and rollback. I will show you why. So it's easy to install on your 
own laptop if you have Linux. Um, you can look for package like this with Geek search with a regular expression. So I want to search here all packages that start, which name start with OpenMPI. You can look for the, the already installed package, packages that you have installed in your own profile. You can install a package with Geeks install your package, and it will be available directly in your shell. Uh, you can see where uh, is, are installed uh, your, um, your solvers uh, and your libraries here in .geeks profile, bin, lib, include, and so on. You can easily remove packages with geeks remove. And you can also uh, like come, come back in the past easily. So for example, you can see that each time you will install or remove packages with geeks, it will record, in fact, a, what we, we will call a generation. So for example, for me and Plafrim, if I try this, geeks package uh, list generation, I have plenty of iterations of what I've done during the past, installing Chameleon, desinstalling, uh, un uninstalling, uh, installing pastings, and so on. So I have a date with it. And if I want, I can go back, come back really easily uh, to a previous uh, package state. So it's really interesting, for example, to, uh, to reproduce some experiments. So you can go back in the past and then switch your generation from past and return to present very easily like this with simple command lines. So update and upgrade, it's uh, really uh, like uh, any package manager. Uh, you can also completely save all your uh, geeks state with, I mean, recording the, the commit of your geeks system. Uh, you can record it in a file, for example, and you can give it to collaborators or save it for the aim of an article to reproduce a, an article you are working on. So you can save the states and it will be really easy to, uh, to get your geeks back to these states without playing with a generation, with a number. You can just save your state in a file and it's over. Geeks also provides uh, interesting things like Geeks environment command, where uh, you can ask for Geeks to prepare um, a development environment to work on a certain uh, solver. So for example, if I want to, to build Petsy, if I want to modify Petsy code, uh, I can let's say uh, use Geeks environment Petsy, and it will prepare for me a shell with all the dependencies available and the compiler ready to be used to compile a Petsy, a version, a modified uh, Petsy version that I'm working on. You can easily also prepare some Docker and Singularity image with all the library you want in it. So to come back to, to our uh, here presentation, um, to use our solver with Geeks, you will need to download, in fact, uh, additional packages. It's really easy. You just have to refer to this website here. It's a, it's a Git. So uh, you have a, a short uh, presentation. And you can see that you just have to prepare a configuration file and say, put this code in it to say that you want to add to your Geeks like a plugin with additional packages. And you will get Chameleon, Pastix, Tarpio, uh, and other packages. So let's try now to use Chameleon Dense Linear Solver. So to install a Chameleon with Geeks, it's really easy. Just have to invoke Geeks install uh, Chameleon. I add uh, the command also openMPI to say that I want my profile is a MPI exec command provided by Geeks. And when it's over, it will build all the things. So here it's always already installed, so it's very short. It's ready in my environment, but it can be a bit long. It will install everything. And uh, here I also add uh, the fact that I want to replace the default LAPAC that uh, I can use, which is OpenBlast. I will replace it by MKL. So all the stack is here with uh, Chameleon. We'll use MKL for uh, LAPAC BLAST kernels. So I also show some examples of uh, how to, to, to build it in your, on your own cluster. So 
usually you already have modules with CMake, compiler, CUDAR, SGBLU lock, OpenMPI, and so on, and MKL. So starting from this, you can then download the star PU, install it. It's really easy. You just have to, to get the tarball, copy it on the cluster, and invoke, configure, and make install. Then you can build Chameleon uh, using star PU. So it will be the same thing. You download Chameleon. And you tell Chameleon where to find star PU using the PKG config mechanism here. So to, to, to indicate uh, to CMake uh, where to find star PU. And then you can use CMake to configure your project. And uh, you can set some option to either enable, disable MPI, CUDA. You can say the blast you want to use. And you can install with make install. And then it will install the library that you can use directly uh, by using the API in your own solver or uh, simulation code. Or you can also uh, use Chameleon by using uh, some executable that we provide in the installation. Uh, so the executable that we provide allows to check uh, the algorithm's performances on some nodes. So it will uh, profile the CPU time. It will give you the uh, performance uh, in terms of gigaflop rate. And it will also, you will have also some option uh, to check the numerical result. So the driver are uh, called Chameleon testing with the precision S, D, C, Z. Here you have a list of available algorithms for this testing. So here, if I want to, to try, to use uh, Chameleon to, to bench a gem over with one MPI process uh, using two threads. It will be like this with a matrix size that will be randomly generated. Uh, it will be a squared matrix of size 3000. You can use this like that. So I have some warning of MPI here, not important. And then I have the result. So I have um, all the input information concerning my matrices, the size, the number of threads I have used, the number of GPUs, the decomposition in terms of MPI, uh, how uh, I distribute my blocks over MPI processes. So here, there is one, so there is no real decomposition. And at the end, you have the results in terms of CPU time and gigaflop rate of your algorithm. So to check other algorithm, you will uh, use minus O, PUTRF, GTRF, GE, QRF, and depending on what you want to, to bench. So let's try on a real nodes. So normally I have a reservation that is already ready for me. So I can perform a SALOC on here uh, to generalist nodes. I will, I will uh, indicate that I want one MPI process per node. It's a common uh, usage uh, with Chameleon is to use one MPI process per node. And uh, all the node is used in, uh, with, uh, with threads, thanks to StarPU. So I have my nodes. I can try an execution of Chameleon. So here, I can try this uh, Cholesky factorization with some matrices of uh, larger and larger sizes. So here for four different sizes. So I submit it and a node here. So for now, I use only one node just to see the performances. So uh, it's really fast and the big Gust matrix, uh, we can solve this in three seconds. So it exhibits three teraflop and a half uh, on the Cholesky on one node. So let's check uh, what it gives on two nodes now. And on two nodes, we can also uh, consider uh, larger matrices like 64,000 if we want. So here for 32,000, uh, okay, something like five, five teraflops. Normally it's more like six. Maybe we'll try another run. And yeah, the, as you can see, the 64,000 uh, sized matrices, 
we could perform in 14 seconds, this Cholesky. And it exhibits a performance of, uh, that is not so bad, of six teraflop uh, on the two nodes. So it's, it was with Cholesky. Now we can also try uh, with different algorithms like uh, GEM. So it's matrix matrix multiplications. So same thing, we try to, to, to get the best performances as we can. So the gem can be really costly dense. Uh, recall that it's uh, in N square here, the complexity. Uh, and uh, factor of uh, power three, I mean, it's cubic. So we could solve this gem uh, with 32,000 size matrices in 21 seconds. So here on one node, three teraflops, and uh, we can check on two nodes. And you can do that for, uh, for, for the available algorithms. So normally I've put um, the list of the available algorithm that you can uh, try. So there are some classical algorithm uh, that you can find in LEPAC library. Just notice that uh, for now, uh, eigenvalue problems uh, are not very good uh, in MPI. It's more to, to be used on the shared memory uh, nodes. It's because it's really difficult algorithm to, to scale. So it will, uh, it will require uh, more research to be able to, to scale uh, eigenvalue problems with MPI. So here, uh, my gem on two nodes, it's, so it's uh, it's two times less than the CPU time on one node. So 10 seconds instead of 21 seconds. So what is interesting with this uh, solver is also that you can, uh, for free, uh, analyze the performances with execution traces. In fact, because we rely on StarPU, uh, StarPU provides a version uh, with uh, traces available, meaning that uh, with FXT enabled, it's another uh, library, it can, uh, in fact, uh, record every event in terms of tasks. It will, uh, in fact, um, record the CPU time uh, uh, of each task on each uh, resources so that we can uh, then display and um, analyze uh, the execution traces with a software like uh, VIT. So here, if you, if you want to try, in fact, with Geeks, it's really easy. Just have to install the version with FXT enabled. You have to uh, tell StarPU uh, where to store the trace files. So here I say in my local di directory. And then I can just execute my Chameleon execution uh, with an additional option with this mi minus minus trace. So by doing that, uh, I have a new file that is created, a prof file is my session name. And then I can use StarPU to convert uh, this profiling file into a page, page file that can be read uh, with, uh, with some, with some uh, solvers, uh, some library like VIT. So you use the StarPU FXT tool that is uh, available in your StarPU installation. And then you have a page trace. And this trace, you can read it with VIT. And it gives you a view like this of all what happens during your algorithm. And I mean, all the tasks that have been uh, submitted to StarPU. So it's really interesting to see if your tasks are well scheduled or not, or if you have some, uh, some uh, overhead uh, because of lack of parallelism or because you have some tasks that are too long on uh, this CPU or on, on this GPU. So as you can see, for example, if I zoom on this, so you have 
representation of some blocks. In pink, you have the generation of the matrix with random values. And in yellow, you have the Cholesky factorization of a diagonal block. Then you have all the TRSM in parallel. And then plenty of gems and TRSM and circ kernels that are scheduled. As you can see, the, it's really efficient. The, they are not real, fin, it's, it's, there is no big overhead in this trace, meaning that we exploit well uh, all the CPUs on this node. So we can do that. We can also compare the Cholesky pure Cholesky factorization with the Cholesky plus triangular solve in this trace. We can also have traces with uh, GPUs or with MPI on several nodes. So as you can see here, it's an example of gem using two nodes. So you have the representation of the two nodes with the communication with the white arrows. You can zoom on your trace and see what really happens uh, in a really precise way. So what is the duration of the task? What was the, the duration of the MPI communication? And you can check that all is normal. And uh, if and if your algorithm maybe uh, needs uh, further work. So you can use Chameleon with GPUs also. So let's change uh, the allocation node. So I can install my version with CUDA, with Geeks, very really easily. Then uh, I can reserve with Slurm a node with GPU. So it's uh, Sirocco means uh, it's a GPU with uh, two V100 GPUs. Here I will help Geeks a little bit uh, by giving him uh, where are the CUDA drivers he, he will need uh, to use uh, CUDA, CUDA devices. And then I can execute my chameleon using GPUs. So here I, um, I add um, a minus J option to say I want to use two GPUs. I have changed also the size of the blocks. So the blocks is the tiles I mentioned before. Here I use uh, larger block sizes to, to use in a, to, to increase in fact uh, the performances over the GPUs. Because if I use too, 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 too small tiles, uh, it will be difficult to, to have the best performances on the GPUs. By default, the tiles are something like 300 sized. So here I perform a Cholesky uh, on a squared matrix of 76,000. Uh, and uh, we perform it in uh, seven seconds. And it exhibits something like 21 teraflops. So it's not so bad especially in comparison with an uh, homogeneous node where the peak performance were around three teraflop and a half. Here, as you can see, something like five, five times faster on a, on a node with GPUs. We can also analyze some trace with GPUs. As you can see here in the, this trace, we have the GPUs represented here, uh, the two last lines, CUDA 0, CUDA 1. Um, we can see that um, for this size of blocks, uh, the task on CPUs are very long, so that in fact the runtime system, StarPU, will schedule and privilege uh, uh, to, 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 to execute the task more on uh, GPUs than on CPUs. And after some times, the CPUs will not be feed because it's better for the overall execution time to schedule uh, more tasks on the GPUs. To use Chameleon in your C, C++ project, uh, we have some documentation. So refer to the official documentation. We have some tutorial uh, in the documentation explaining the, how to, to use the API of Chameleon. So it's really uh, similar uh, to LAPAC at first, but first you have to initialize and finalize uh, 
you, you have to initialize your chameleon with chameleon init. Then you can see the tutorial with a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial helping you to understand uh, chameleon into more and more uh, complex uh, and it's enter more and more into details. So we show first an example using uh, LAPAC and BLAST to perform a Cholesky. Then we compare how to do the same thing, the exact same thing using the Chameleon API. So it will be really similar and it will perform the same operation on the same kind of data, which uh, here are LAPAC uh, vectors. So it's just, you know, contiguous uh, in memory, uh, big array. Uh, so storing the, the columns of the matrix one by one. Um, but by doing that, in fact, uh, we hide the fact that uh, there is a conversion of this data into a tiled matrix on which we will work uh, with Chameleon and StarPU. So the best uh, way is then to try to understand how to use a tile interface, meaning that you will directly use a Chameleon structure to store the matrix. So structure uh, of the matrix is uh, in fact, storing the matrix by tiles in a contiguous way. So each tile is stored contiguously. Uh, but you also have a function to, I mean, let start you uh, handle the memory and just give some functions uh, about how to fill each uh, sub piece of the matrix. So you have function to understand about how to fill this structure. Or you can directly use some function uh, provided in Chameleon to, to convert your LAPAC data into Chameleon data. So have a look to this tutorial. Uh, it will also explain how to use the asynchronous interface. So the, the one I was mentioning when I was saying that we can uh, give different uh, subsequent algorithm as a sequence without any synchronization of the runtime system. So that's all the tasks of this algorithm are pipelined together. So we show examples. All, all available uh, computational routines of Chameleon are also available in the, in the section of the documentation here. So as you can see, uh, we show that we have BLAST two, three routines and some laypack conventional uh, routines like triangular solving, Cholesky, all the LU routines, QR, LQ, and uh, eigenvalue algorithms. So let's talk about PASTIX. Uh, ah, the, the presentation about Chameleon is over. And if you have any issues, uh, do not hesitate to send uh, an email to me directly. Um, in fact, you could uh, also work with us uh, directly on the GitLab project. But for political reason, uh, INRIA has closed. Uh, I mean, external users cannot easily have an account uh, by themselves. So we have to register uh, external users. Uh, so you have to, to send an email to an INRIA member, and then we can create for you an account on the GitLab. And then you will be able, of course, to submit directly issues in the GitLab interface to, 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 to speak with us easily and to, to collaborate. So PASTIX. Um, so PASTIX is, uh, has been developed uh, since several years. Uh, previous version was PASTIX 5. Uh, it was uh, hosted on the INRIA GForge. But now it is considered as a um, old version that maybe should not be used anymore. The new version of Pastix is on GitLab now side. It's Pastix version 6. You will see this new version here. It is, uh, we'll say, rewritten. Um, you can install it with Geeks also, like this. with the same kind of command as Chameleon. Um, but you can also try to, to use CMake to build it on your computer. It's the same thing as Chameleon, but you will need maybe a Scotch uh, in addition. Yes, Scotch. 
Uh, here I will show an example by using my own uh, my own installation using CMake because for now um, the package in Geeks for CUDA is not ready. You can you can use Pastix for MPI and on shared memory uh, nodes and with MPI, but not with CUDA. We have to to work on it. So we'll use this uh, procedure to install Pastix. So here I, I already have installed uh, Pastix, in fact. So what I can do is reserve uh, GPU nodes directly. Uh, so my node with V100 uh, GPUs. I will load the appropriate modules. So CMake, GCC, CUDA, MKL, OpenMPI, Scotch, and Parsec and StarPU which are the runtime systems that are available. So here I have an installation ready of Pastix. You can try to do it at home. And you can try to, to use Pastix directly like that. Uh, by using uh, some provided um, drivers. So it's the same idea as Chameleon. Uh, we provide some executables to, to bench uh, the performances of the LU and Cholesky on the matrices you want, or on some generated da data. So here, for example, a Cholesky factorization, or first, let's say, a, a Cholesky on a generated Laplacian. La 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 so here we generate a Laplacian matrix directly using the Pastix simple executable. So you just perform a LU normally, a LU factorization of that. You can use it like that. So here it performs uh, the factorization using uh, 40 CPUs of the node uh, without GPUs for, for now. Um, you have some parameters that are given here. It explains that by default, you use uh, the native uh, scheduling strategy uh, inside Pastix. You do not use runtime system. We will see how to use them. Uh, and then it, uh, it shows uh, the CPU time needed for ordering symbolic step, reordering step, analyze step. And the most important for us here part is the factorization step part. So the time to factorize, the estimate um, performance in terms of gigaflop, the time to solve, and so on, and the, the numerical solution uh, precision. So here for the example on a really simple Laplacian. Now let's try on real uh, matrices. So here we will perform a Cholesky factorization and um, let's say an OD matrix. So it's a matrix that you can find in the sweet sparse uh, matrix collection. Um, it's in matrix market format. We can directly give it to uh, one of the, um, of the drivers of Pastix, like simple or bench facto. You will use a minus F to choose a factorization uh, type to apply. So either Cholesky or LDLT or uh, LU and so on. You can use minus S uh, to choose the time as scheduler. So for example, let's try an example using 40 cores uh, on the OD with two GPUs with Parsec runtime system. So here uh, we also add some option uh, which are the minimum block size in order to improve a little bit uh, the kernels that are uh, applied on the GPUs. If we send uh, two small blocks uh, on the GPUs, the, um, the overall algorithm will not be efficient because th this task will not be efficient enough to exhibit uh, the real power of, uh, of the GPUs. So in fact, here uh, I don't have all the best uh, parameters because I'm not directly expert of this solver. I'm not um, one of the main developers. The main developer is uh, Mathieu Faverge and Pierre Ramé. It's a researcher uh, at uh, 
the Labri in Bordeaux. So I'm just showing some uh, way to use it. But if you want uh, more precise uh, hints about how to optimize the parameters of PASTIX to have better performance, especially using GPUs, uh, the best way is to send them an email. In fact, I think that in the, the official documentation of PASTIX, they give some, uh, some hints for GPUs. Uh, like if I show you the documentation, there is here some example how to use on GPUs and they give some additional hints, uh, very, I think, technical uh, things about, you know, CUDA streams to, to say uh, how many uh, kernels I can pipeline uh, in parallel, uh, I can send in parallel on my GPUs. This will optimize things. So there are technical things here on this page. So here on our example, what we can observe is that if I perform my Cholesky factorization on the OD matrix using CPUs only, I will have something like 400 gigaflop. If I use two GPUs, I will reach something like one teraflop. Uh, no, it's LU factorization, sorry. So it's on the OD, you will have 700 gigaflop with GPUs with CPUs only. With one or two GPUs, you will uh, improve a little bit, with, but it's not uh, really sensational. We'll have 900 and can reach one teraflop. But uh, I'm sure you can, we, we, we can do best maybe with better parameters, especially with playing with block sizes and CUDA streams. So you have to play a little bit with that parameters. So here my example uh, on uh, the OD matrix using two GPUs. So I have something like 1.1 teraflop, like I said, on this factorization. So the factorization part, if I remove uh, all the stuff about analyzing and, and other steps, symbolic factorization and so on, for the factorization part, it's performed in four seconds for this matrix. If you want to perform uh, LU factorization, you will uh, have to change the, um, the parameter. So you will use minus F2 to apply a LU factorization if you know that your matrix is not SPD and it's a general matrix. So here is examples. Uh, we have, for example, uh, this matrix uh, without GPUs. Uh, we perform the factorization in uh, 400 gigaflop. Using two GPUs, we will uh, raise one teraflop. And uh, we show also that we can use, in fact, low rank compression techniques over kernels. So these techniques cannot be used on GPUs. But uh, by using this technique on uh, homogeneous nodes, in fact, you can reach something similar in terms of performance than using nodes with GPUs. On this example, for example, we have the same performance uh, using low rank techniques on the 40 CPUs in comparison with uh, the normal techniques with dense kernels uh, on uh, the 40 CPUs plus the two V100 GPUs. So here to enable the low rank factorization, the low rank kernels, I will add a minus e uh, e perm compress when two to say that I want to apply a strategy with low rank, uh, which optimize the CPU time, and I will add a parameter to to give um, the precision I want on my low rank kernels. So here is to how to, to you can play with uh, Plastix drivers. You can also generate traces with Plastix by using StarPU plus FXT. Uh, but you can also use, a, we can say, a more generic solution. Uh, if you want to have traces, whatever the runtime 
uh, can be the PASTIX uh, scheduling strategy or PARSEC or STARPU, you can use, in fact, easy trace, which uh, directly will uh, generate the trace without FXT. So we, here is an example on how to use it. So I, I've showed um, in the CMake uh, build, I've showed that if you have an easy trace installed, you can build a PASTIX with easy trace enabled. And by doing that, after you just have to to tell uh, easy trace uh, which level of kernels you want to trace and to intercept and easy trace will recognize uh, his module kernels for pastix and it, it, each time it will uh, see uh, a pastix kernel it will intercept it and and add uh, flags uh, to, to to know uh, the cpu time of each kernel and the same way uh, you can generate traces at runtime it will provide you a file that you can convert in a page trace file and you can use it to to see what happens so what is interesting here with easy trace is that uh, in this case you can use it with every uh, runtime solution to use plastic in your own c c++ project please refer to the official documentation so you have several examples uh, Ah, yes, here, the results of my uh, LU factorization using compression technique. So it has been done. You can see uh, that you have used the normal scheduling strategy of PASTIX without runtime system because we don't need them here for, for because we don't, we don't use GPUs, in fact. Um, you have a summary of the Laurent parameters. And you can see that uh, in fact, we have a performance that is comparable to the one with GPUs. And uh, in addition, in fact, it's uh, less memory uh, consuming. It, it consumes less memory. So here, examples of PASTIX. You can directly uh, look at the simple example, for, for instance. So it's rather simple example. It shows you how to, to use uh, how to fill uh, PASTIX data. I mean, to use PASTIX, you will need to declare some uh, SPM matrix, which is a format of matrices for uh, matrix. Uh, this uh, format of matrix can handle, uh, you know, uh, CSC, CSR, and EG value uh, formats. It comes from a library which is called SPM. SPM, I have a link here. So it explains how to use this driver. So how to, to give your matrix in a SPM format so that it can be used by Pastix. So you have several examples here where you just have to, to declare a certain structure, give some parameters, then you can allocate the array directly with uh, an allocation of the library, and then you will be able to fill by yourself the, the arrays uh, with the values and the different position in the matrices. Once you have your sparse matrix, you can do PASTIX operation, like uh, analysis phase, numerical factorization, solve, and iterative refinements. You can also uh, uh, perform scaling on your matrix or your vectors. You can perform also sparse uh, uh, matrix uh, multiplications with PASTIX. So last, and uh, if you have some issues with Plastix, please send an email to Mathieu Faverge, which is the main developer of this library. So concerning uh, the last solver, Mafiz, um, so Mafiz can be also uh, be installed easily with uh, Geeks. So here, let's try. So I release, uh, release my node. I will purge my environment 
without module. I will install Mafis. I added here some uh, some parameter to Geeks to say that I want a Mafis with uh, MKL instead of OpenBlast. And if in the stack there are also netlib lapak, it will be replaced also by MKL. If, if, if I depend on MUMS, in fact, it will be a MUMS MKL with OpenMPI. So it's just replacement to say that I want a full stack with Intel MKL as a blast lapak. So here with this line, I can directly get where Mafis is installed in my system. So Mafis root is this pass. I will use it to, to get access to my executables that uh, Mafis provides. So in the same way as Chameleon and Pastix, uh, we provide as installation some drivers to test Mafis on several kinds of matrices. I show you an example of how to build also Mafis directly uh, by your own. So for example, uh, relying on CMake, GCC, HW lock, OpenMPI, MKL, Scotch, you can directly uh, install Pastix by, you, by yourself. I show an example here of, of, with Pastix 603, which is not the latest uh, release, but it's uh, a release I'm sure that is compatible with uh, this version of Mafis. So um, here is a simple installation of Pastix, and then Mafis can be built using Pastix. So here with my CMake option, I say that I enable Pastix on. I disable MUMS for now. I use um, Intel MKL parallel here, and I can install with make install. So it provides the examples uh, in the examples directory of the installation. Uh, you have a driver with, which is called uh, MPH example KV, where you can perform uh, your uh, domain decomposition and resolution of linear systems on uh, several kinds of matrices. You have several precisions that can be used, SDCZ. You can uh, use uh, matrices that comes from sweet sparse matrix collection. So for example, here we will first show some parameters that you can use, uh, that you have to understand to use MAFIs by using a really simple matrix here. Uh, that is a small matrix size of 10,000, which is a BCSSTK 17. The matrix uh, with this driver can be a format uh, .egv, mm, mtx, and so on. Some are not uh, supported here, it is written. So how to use a driver? You have to fill the information in an input file. So you just fill a simple uh, input file in TXT format. So here, for, for instance, uh, I have simple.in, but you can call it as you want. So at first, I will show you a really simple example. So I consider my, that my matrix is uh, available uh, here in my current directory. I consider, um, I add an option to say to the driver that my matrix is symmetric. If you want to consider the matrix as SPD, you can give the information by, uh, with the parameter one here. And if your matrix is uh, completely general, you will use zero. So I have uh, this simple example ready. So I can directly now use Mafis this way. So maybe I will first um, allocate a node. But contrary to Camellio and Pastix, at first, instead of using only one MPI process per node, for Mafis, I will try situation with several MPI process per node. Because by default, we can say that uh, Mafis is used to um, to perform domain decomposition, so uh, with one MPI process per ha handling each subdomains, and that each subdomains and MPI process are binded uh, to a CPU core. It's a default way of using MAFIs. We will see just after how to use it uh, with MPI plus threads. 
So here I can say to Slurm, uh, I want, uh, I don't know, two nodes with, I don't know, 32 MPI process per node. Okay, I have it. I can try my execution. So for now, just a simple example with just two processors used, so two cores uh, with two uh, subdomains. So it will solve the problem. You will have plenty of information. So it will recall you uh, the number of iteration of the um, iterative solver used, the kind of solver that has been used, so here, GMRES. Uh, the sizes of local systems, the sizes of local shore, the, how to say the number of subdomains that have been used. And uh, you can see at the end of the execution, the CPU time of each operation, the analyze phase, the factorize on local subsystem phase, the preconditioning phase, and the solving step. You also have uh, the solution. So here, uh, I don't have given any right-hand side. So by default, it will generate the right-hand side considering that the solution must be the vector one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. So here, uh, my solution is not very good at convergence. In fact, I converge very fast in two iterations here. But my uh, criterion for convergence for the iterative system was a bit uh, light. Uh, here it's just 10 minus 5, five um, for the backward error. So maybe it would be a good idea to, to make it a, a bit more drastic, like uh, if I change this criterion for the convergence. So I have to change in my parameter file. So you, it can be the same thing in your C or Fortran code. You can change this parameter directly. So it was something like uh, ECNTL21 equal 1.0 minus admit, let's say nine. It's better than minus five. I mean, I want a more precise solution here. Okay, what happened? Ah, okay. I, it was not um, it was not the good parameter. I think it's I is ICNTL is for integer kind parameters. I should use R for real uh, kind of uh, parameters. So I think it's more this one. Yeah, I think it was this one. So now I converge in six iterations for this problem and uh, the solutions are better. So you can try with more subdomains and using more cores on the node. So for now, in fact, because I, I'm just using uh, four or two subdomains, I'm, I'm just using two or four cores, so I'm just working on one node for now. So if you increase the number of subdomains, you will certainly observe uh, convergence loss, so you will need more iteration to converge. But uh, in fact, it's a natural drawback because in the same time you have used more cores and in fact you, you will have uh, smaller subsystems to solve and the time for factorizing will be lower each time you will uh, decompose more and more your global problem. So you will win certainly uh, some time on the factorization of your uh, subsystems. And you will certainly uh, conversely uh, lose sometimes on the solving process because you will need more iterations to reach convergence. So it's things to, to analyze, to understand, depending on your matrix properties. Here, uh, this matrix uh, is really extreme because it is really ill-conditioned. Ill I think the condition number of this matrix is 10 al power 10, which is very high condition number. So it's more difficult to get a good solution. We have to, we need to, to perform uh, more iterations. So what we can say here is that for now we have used uh, sim equal to, meaning uh, we just give to Mafi the information that my matrix was um, 
symmetric, but in fact, I can do more because this matrix is SPD, symmetric positive definite, so that in fact, I can use uh, a CG iterative algorithm. So conjugate gradient is known to, to be well fitted uh, for SPD matrices. And why? Because uh, it will not require what GMRS needs. I mean, uh, it will not uh, involve uh, computation of uh, orthogonal basis that can be really uh, consuming in terms of memory. It's very costly, I mean, in terms of memory. So if you can use CG because your matrix is SPD, use it. So you have to replace um, parameter by here one, if you know that. And you can check that uh, the, the iterative solver that is using CG instead of GMRES. It will optimize uh, your memory. So now, if you want to try, for instance, on this matrix with more sub subdomains, you can try with, for example, five. Normally, we will have a surprise. So we have to understand that you will have an, er an error here. Um, so MAFI is, in fact, for its domain decomposition technique, uh, rely on uh, nested dissection. So it's, in fact, it's B partitioning of the graph. So uh, you need to have a number of domains that is a power of two. So you will need to uh, use also a number of MPI processes that is a number of two. So if you use four or eight or 16, it will be okay. Another problem that you can get is that if you use the default domain decomposition technique of MAFIS using PT Scotch, you can raise some errors like this. So here you have this strange message uh, saying that uh, partitioning with Scotch has failed. Uh, so in this case, uh, instead of relying on directly PT Scotch to partition your graph, uh, we recommend to use a paddle algorithm that is an external library that we use to, to, to get a really robust algebraic domain decomposition. So it's a dependency of MAFIS here. To use it, just have to build, of course, with it at configure, but um, also you can enable it in your file with this criterion, with this parameter. So ICNTL 49 at two, you will use Paddle and you will be able to rely on a robust domain decomposition technique. So now it's, uh, it's able to solve this problem with 16 domains. So the backward and forward error analysis, we, we have already mentioned it. So it can be, you have to, to be careful with that and to use the good criterion for uh, your needs. You can change the sparse direct solvers by using uh, ICNTL 13 to choose between PASTIX or MIMS to be used for local systems. You can show more information with these parameters, five and six. You can use sparsification techniques. So meaning that uh, when for the, the, the iterative, in fact, uh, algorithm, CG and GMRES, it is done on a, an interface problem and a problem that is related to interface unknowns. Uh, this iterative system is preconditioned uh, using block diagonal matrix, which are the, the sure uh, matrices coming from the subsystems. Those sure generally, they are dense matrices. So we use dense LAPAC factorization on it. But if you could try to, in fact, sparsify these matrices and use a sparse solver instead of a dense solver on it in order to maybe uh, gain, uh, have gains in CPU time and also in terms of memory on this part. So to use this, you use ICNTL21 at two which is, I'm, I think, the default, in fact, uh, parameter. It's, it's a default. Uh, the default is to use sparsification, in fact, and so uh, to, to apply uh, the sparse solvers on the sure matrices. Uh, and then you, you, you have to understand that there is another criterion with this epsilon, meaning that we will drop uh, every values in the sure matrices that are lower than this criterion. It is a threshold you can change by yourself. 
If you want to disable the specification and certainly have a more robust but more costly, certainly preconditioner because you will perform dense LU factorization on your shores. So it will be, yeah, you will, it will be more expensive in terms of memory, especially. Uh, you can use this parameter and turn it uh, to one, I think. So here yeah, I use uh, dense factorization on the shores. Well, on this problem, it's the same convergence, but uh, on some others, uh, you will have better convergence with parameter one here instead of the specification techniques. If you are not afraid with memory, it's better to use this. You can force GMRS by yourself instead of CG. Uh, we recommend also if you work with multiple right hand sides, you could replace the basic CG on GMRS that are used in MAFIS by the fabulous uh, library. So, this library is an external library that you can install and you can build MAFIS with it. And you can replace the iterative solver uh, with fabulous. It will be better for problems. Um, that needs multiple right-hand sides. So for large test case example, like the OD, we can show an example here. What we can see is that um, if I use this input file on my driver, so if I say that it is symmetric, I say to use Pastix, to use Paddle for the domain decomposition, so I want 10 minus 9 for the precision of the iterative method. Uh, I, if I send this on, uh, on the 64 uh, MPI processes over the two nodes, in fact, uh, I will have convergence problem. In fact, it will not converge after 100 iterations. This is because I, I cut too much my problem into sub pieces. And maybe the problem is a bit complex here and uh, it's difficult to converge. So what we can do in this situation is to use instead of using one subdomain per cores is to use MPI plus threads. So getting one subdomain per MPI process, but we can use several cores inside the resolution of each uh, subsystems. So by, to, to do that, you have to use the parameters 42 at one to enable multi-threading inside subdomains. And then you will say uh, your configuration, like uh, how many physical computing machines you use, so the number of nodes, the number of cores on each machine, the number of threads you want to use per MPI process, and the number of MPI, MPI processes, and so which is in fact the number of subdomains. By doing that, you will see that you can converge in 15 iterations, but with a lot um, with a lot of uh, time spent into the factorization of the local matrices, because here we have two big uh, factorization to, to do on each uh, MPI process, on each node. So maybe it scales not uh, so well uh, in Pastix on each node using all the 36 threads. So after, you, what you can do to optimize uh, is in fact to, to have a compromise between the number of domains you use and the number of threads, uh, the, the number of threads used inside your subdomains. You can try so solutions in between like this. So using four subdomains on two nodes, letting each subdomain used 18 threads. And also can try with eight subdomains, each subdomain using nine threads. And if we see to the results here, we can see that, for example, the factorization time is usually twice less. So here, with two domains, my, factor, my sparse factorization on the local system is 22 seconds. Here it's 10. So I gain, I, uh, I, I win some time on the factorization, but on the contra contrary part, on the solving, I will have more iterations to do, 30 iterations. 
So you have to check what is the overall gain. So here, for example, in the first situation with two subdomains, I performed the, the resolution in 100 seconds with four subdomains in 80 seconds. So it's better to use this solution. And in the end, if I use, in fact, eight, eight subdomains on the two nodes uh, using four MPI processes per node, I have my best re solution here with 78 seconds. And uh, in fact, it can be better using the dense sure factorization in the preconditioning here. I will have a, a better CPU time on the on the iterations here, seven instead of eighteen, because I converge um, faster. So for really really large uh, matrices, uh, you could use coarse grain correction. So you have to see it with this parameter twenty one. And you can use uh, and see how to use MAFIS in your C Fortran code and soon in C++. You can see the official uh, documentation here. You have examples on how to use MAFIS in your code. In Fortran, you have example in C. And you have also examples on how to, 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 to give your matrix either in a centralized way on one node or also in a distributed way from several nodes. So it is explained here in this section 5.2 of the documentation. Thank you for your attention. So it's over for me. If you have any question, uh, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Florent. So questions open. No questions, even in the pod. So I can just comment on one thing, uh, not about the presentation, about the fact that um, all these other presentations are now uh, online on the website, and I put I put them all, all on, um, also in the uh, in the in the schedule. So you can find the presentations both on the front page and also in the program associated to each topic. So I guess, Flo, you have a question from yep, Luca. There's a question in the chat from Luca, yes. Yeah. Yes, um, so asynchronous run, yes. Yes. Um, uh, so, Chameleon can directly do it by itself. So if you use Chameleon, in fact, if you use Chameleon in an application and there are some like in ZCA or, or in, Total or EDF, Airbus, they already have used, for example, Chameleon, and so they rely on it, and they can be planned uh, algorithm using StarPU. Uh, but um, for me, in the two last years, I also have um, to work on um, a program, which is called Diodon, uh, which is performing some uh, data analysis on, uh, on big data, like uh, ACP or things like that when we have to perform some SVD decomposition. So it's really an application for biologists. And uh, we use, for example, Chameleon to do that. And in fact, we have uh, several kinds of algorithms. We have algorithms to load um, our data from HDF5 files, you know. Uh, so we can do it directly uh, with StarPU function. 
So we have a, a task-based algorithm to read our piece of data directly from the HDF5 files. And in fact, we can pipeline the, this data reading with Chameleon, directly Chameleon asynchronous interface. Uh, so I can directly apply some gem and QR decompositions that are needed in my uh, SVD. Um, so yeah, I already have examples, but I don't know, I don't know, um, I have, don't have a clear example of well-known. Uh, I know that we already did it in our collaborations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For, I was just asking about this because uh, we have been using Exageostat, mm -hmm. which is an application that is available uh, in the GitHub uh, to play around with different uh, load balancing uh, mm -hmm. strategies, static load balancing strategies. So we are uh, finishing this work and we are looking for another application that might be uh, interesting to, to apply uh, our so, methods. Yeah, so maybe I, I, we could discuss together because uh, okay. I have one that you can use. So the Diodon program uh, I just mm -hmm. mentioned. So yeah. it's used I think, to perform. I think, uh, yeah. I, th I think that uh, we discussed uh, with Mathieu a couple yes. of uh, months ago about the SVD application that you just mentioned, if I understood yes, correctly. Yes, yes. Clearly. And, uh, uh, but, but the thing is that uh, the source code was in, unavailable at that point or close to the members. Yeah, the for now it's closed, but uh, I think we can... In fact, yeah. I, I'm currently in a project that will last uh, two years. So it's uh, two future uh, years mm -hmm. starting from now uh, yeah. where I, I have to work on this project to, to make it open. In, mm -hmm. in fact, we want to provide a C++ code to perform ACP, uh, multi-dimensional scaling problems that rely on uh, randomized SVD mm -hmm. that use Chameleon and StarPU. So I want to use it on really large data and to perform it uh, on hundreds of nodes. Okay. So the idea finally is to, to give it uh, for uh, as an open source software. So right. for now, what, what we can do, uh, I think I can add you to the project. Mm -hmm. Actually, actually, it would be more useful if you add my students, my PhD student, uh, in the okay. because yeah, he's okay. the guy that is doing the experiments and, and things like that. But I'm no uh, problem. I think yeah. we can do that and uh, just send an email, and I will add you to the project. Okay. Is there, there, so are, there are no secrets in it. It's just that uh, mm -hmm. because sure. maybe it's not uh, robust enough, we don't want to to okay. show it as an open source software. Okay. For now, yeah. but uh, so it can be used. Yeah, my, my PG student just posed you another question, so I let you move forward. Okay. Thank you a lot, Florent, for for the for the demo as well. Thank you. So yes, Florent, there's another question from Michael Lazy in the chat. Ah yes, uh, I see that you guys supported the SPAC repository for some time for Chameleon. I was just curious about the transition to Geeks. What to motivate it? Uh, it's really that, um, so we first, uh, yes, uh, work on SPAC packages. Uh, we used it uh, to, 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 to deploy our um, solvers and clusters. But in fact, we had a lot of issues uh, with SPAC because um, because you can have a lot of incompatibilities. In fact, uh, it does not rely on the same mechanism as Geeks uh, for, um, for building all the softwares. In fact, uh, usually on clusters, you will need to declare in SPAC some external components like the MPI or the Intel MKL. Uh, and those um, hints, could in fact break many things when, uh, when we want to build and raise uh, incompatibilities between uh, some of the libraries. So in many cases, we had some uh, problem of installation with SPAC. So that's why we were looking for a more uh, robust solution. And um, we had uh, a project in, at Inria Bordeaux with a, with a colleague uh, that work uh, directly in Geeks. So the, the the, the project is called uh, Geeks HPC. And so with him, uh, we have uh, developed new packages for our solvers. 
And it's true that uh, now we really use more gigs than SPAC because it's really, really more robust concerning the, the deployment. Because gigs, in fact, uh, control everything in the installation process. Nothing is from uh, external, uh, exterior from gigs, in fact. So if we already succeed in, in uh, installing uh, one server uh, in some Git states on my laptop, I'm sure I will have the exact same thing on the cluster if we not rely on uh, other components already installed in the cluster. OK. So if there is no more questions, uh, I will say thank you again to Florian Provost for, for this presentation. And we'll have a short break, 30 minutes, a bit less, I guess. Yes, 20 minutes, because we, we start again at 5 p.m., uh, 4 p.m., sorry. Um, and uh, so have a, have a good coffee <laughs> during this break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Your presentation. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm ready. For, I'm ready to present. Okay. So you can uh, you can start. I can start. So I will start by sharing the screen. Everybody, uh, sorry. Everybody can see this, my screen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and let's pick up this in case I need to underline something. Okay, thank you very much. And so now I'm going to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, our project, which is a set of linear algebra algorithms for a sparse linear algebra. So we are dealing with iterative solvers of all, uh, of all kinds. And uh, this, this presentation is split in two parts. In the, in the first part, I will present some background material, uh, whereas in the second part, Fabio Durastante will present uh, the, uh, the research on preconditioners, which is the core of the activities that are being carried out within, uh, within ECHO. So, and this is reflected in the fact that uh, uh, our software is currently, for, uh, for, for historical reasons, uh, split into two main packages. I will, uh, I will tell you a little bit uh, later on about, about this. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the, uh, the team of people that have at various times uh, uh, contributed to our project. Uh, uh, some of them are no longer active, uh, they left the project, uh, and some of them are still uh, on board. Um, Okay, so the, uh, the basic idea about uh, PS Blast, uh, which is called Parallel Sparse Blast, it's, uh, it's designed for iterative solvers, uh, but uh, when you deal with uh, sparse matrices in uh, parallel computers, uh, you are actually uh, dealing with uh, uh, discretiz the discretization graphs of certain uh, models. So you need to include some functions uh, for mesh handling. So it's not just linear algebra operations. You have many, many other support operations that you need to, uh, to work through. And we started our work uh, looking at PDEs. Uh, uh, and uh, we, the, with the basic idea is that uh, data allocation is done through some sort of graph or mesh partitioning. We have support for overlap among the subdomains uh, and uh, a few other things. And uh, uh, here you can see, you can go on GitHub and download the, uh, uh, download the latest stable version, uh, and which is 3.6.1. And you can uh, compile it, but also, but see also that we do have uh, uh, RPMs available for Fedora and Kentos. Uh, so you don't need to do anything in that case, uh, just uh, use your package manager. Um, at this time, we are, uh, we are actively developing version 3.7.0. Uh, we do have a draft release candidate now, uh, which is out for, uh, for feedback and for testing. 
Uh, and that is the version that will be published by the end of the project because it's the version that's needed to include all of the changes that we have put into the uh, into the uh, preconditioners package that uh, Fabio will tell you about later on. Uh, this project has a uh, fairly long history. Uh, in fact, the uh, there are two, the two main papers describing the project are the uh, are the the one in uh, in the year 2000 and one year 2012, uh, and uh, I gather that you all know Alfredo Buttari from uh, CNRS and uh, the uh, University of Toulouse. So uh, um, he has contributed. He has uh, contributed at, uh, a for 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 a somewhat large period of time to to the project itself. So you can either go to GitHub and uh, look at my uh, at my uh, page and uh, and the page that we will discuss later, and you can download and compile yourself the development versions, or you can just use the uh, RPMs for the stable versions, with the understanding that uh, these RPMs will change uh, <clears throat> during this year because of the uh, releases that we are putting out uh, for, uh, supported by the ECHO project. Okay, so see, this is basically the structure. We ha You have an application that can use uh, our software and our software offers a C interface and the Fortran interface. It is developed mainly in Fortran 2008. Uh, and uh, uh, we will discuss a few features later on. And internally, we have the uh, serial sparse blasts, which are also part of our software. And obviously, we use MPI just about like uh, just about anyone else. Okay, so this is the uh, 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 the uh, the basic structure of what we are going to uh, to show. Let's see. Uh, the, the original idea was to take uh, a proposal for serial sparse blast, which originated by work from Ian Duff uh, and other people uh, back in the, uh, in, the, in, the two, in the early 2000s. And we extended the, that work to handle uh, uh, parallel computations. And then we uh, went on to do, uh, uh, on the one hand, research on uh, new kinds of preconditioners, uh, like uh, the ones that are contained in the AMG for PS Plus, which is algebraic multigrid for PS Plus, and as well as uh, trying to keep track of the requirements that we impose on the users and to, to, to make life for the users as simple as possible uh, by, by providing support tools for mesh handling and uh, for the uh, parallelization issues. Uh, we will uh, see a little bit of this in, the, in, uh, in this tutorial, in this presentation. Okay, so what are the, the components that we have? Well, we have a parallel environment handling. We have our own, uh, uh, our own layer on top of MPI. Then we have some computational kernels, the typical computational kernels that are used by all iterative solvers, which is sparse matrix vector products, uh, sparse triangular system solution, uh, vector norms, matrix norms, uh, vector sums, and vector dot products. Then we have a very important uh, uh, thing, which is the data exchange operators. Uh, in the MPI jargon, they would be, uh, they could be described as persistent neighborhood all to variable all to all data exchanges. And they've only very recently been standardized in, uh, in uh, MPI and they're in MPI 5. And it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very complicated matter. Uh, and, and the standard MPI is very far behind in the implementation of this particular kernel, although its importance has been recognized. And in fact, uh, the, it, has been, uh, <coughs> it has been dealt with uh, in the latest iterations uh, of the standard proposals. Okay, so then we have the data management, and uh, again, and then at that point we can invoke our preconditioner setup routines and the iterative solver routines. Notice that the preconditioner setup is the step for which you can substitute the AMG for PS Blast preconditioners. 
uh, which will give you, they, they will give you better performance, uh, but the rest of the framework uh, uh, is used exa exactly as is. And in particular, the iterative solvers accept uh, objects, uh, preconditioned objects defined by either the base library or the uh, multi-grid library. Okay, so let's uh, take a quick look at the parallel environment. Uh, we have defined our own uh, subset of the parallel environment. This may seem like a strange thing uh, when, you're, when you have MPI, but there are two uh, reasons for this. The first reason is that at the time we started the project, uh, uh, there, were, there were still uh, a few other, uh, few other uh, message passing programming interfaces around. Uh, they, are, they are now de uh, dead. All of them have disappeared and only MPI has survived. Uh, so it's, uh, it's obvious that we only use MPI. Although uh, there, are some, there is some research, very active research in uh, PIGAS languages and in the transport layers for PIGAS languages. Uh, so they, we do have a PIGAS version of uh, our library, but that's a very experimental one and it's not uh, widely available. Uh, something that we plan to look into uh, more closely into uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, the other thing is that uh, we have defined this uh, interface at the time where the Fortran interface for, uh, for MPI was not very well developed, so we defined our own generic interfaces, which means that uh, you can make sure that you are not uh, dealing with those silly mistakes like uh, uh, passing a buffer of one type and declaring it to be of a different type that cannot happen because the type uh, system is resolved by the compiler. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the uh, usual environment stuff, you have a PSD in it uh, where you initialize your environment. Uh, you may start from uh, uh, the equivalent from the equivalent of MPI com word, or you can have a basic context uh, uh, that you are creating a copy of, or you are creating a subset of the communication the communication context, which is essentially a communicator, by the way. And then you have PSB exit for closing the context uh, and. Uh, uh, you can choose whether you need to uh, to present. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, you can choose whether you need to close the um, the. Uh, would need to close to call MPI finalize or not? That's uh, up to you. Uh, should you need access to the actual MPI communicator, you can uh, if, because you, for instance, because you if you want to call MPI directly, you can get a copy of this in in uh, in this fashion. Okay, uh, very well. Now let's uh, go. And now you have all of most of the information that you really need uh, to write a hello world program, which is a very simple one. And then as you can see, you have to use uh, uh, this module, uh, which is the uh, module that contains all of the basic operators. Uh, there are three other modules uh, in, uh, in PS Plus. There is a preconditioner module, uh, there is a Krill of subspace methods module, and then there is a utility module which contains uh, some additional stuff. Uh, you can call a PSB init, uh, info, and this is the, your usual hello world program. So I don't think I need to, uh, to, 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 uh, to discuss it uh, any further. Uh, the, um, once you have installed your, uh, uh, your library, you can include uh, uh, in, uh, you can include uh, this uh, make file fragment, which will uh, contain all of the definitions uh, that have been uh, put into the compilation of the of the version that you are currently using, so that you can uh, uh, parameterize your make files based on the uh, on the contents of that one, and you don't have any uh, any special surprises, uh, shall we say, you know, or any unpleasant surprises. Okay, so we do have a C interface. In general, the C interface looks like this. If you have a routine that's called PSB something, then your C interface will look like PSB C something. And in between, there may be 
a letter specifying the precision, like uh, single, uh, double, uh, complex, uh, double complex, the usual S, C, D, Z uh, precision uh, uh, keyword. Uh, or, as in this case, uh, there is no intermediate precision keyword because these functions only uh, come in one version, so there is no need to distinguish between different precisions. All of these things are in, uh, in, uh, in a base C bind uh, header file, and it's uh, so that's the kind of uh, that's the header that you're going to include into all of your uh, all of your. Uh, uh, <clears throat> programs. Uh, let me also add one thing. Uh, I am not going to show you a complete program in this in uh, in this uh, tutorial, but you do have a number of sample programs uh, in the library distribution itself. So you can take them and modify them to suit your purposes if you if you so wish. This is the hello world uh, in, in C, and it's uh, that's basically what you are uh, looking at. It's very simple. Uh, again, nothing special in this code. And uh, and again, you can still reuse the uh, the include uh, from the uh, from the installation, and you uh, need to add this library, which is the C binding library for our for our basic library. Okay, great. Let's move on. Uh, we do provide point-to-point -point communications, and as I said, in uh, Fortran they are simply send and receive because the, uh, the Fortran compiler will uh, dispatch to the proper uh, internal routine, uh, depending on the type of the data that you're sending, depending on the fact that, that you're sending an array or uh, a matrix, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, all, of these, uh, all of these factors are contained. Uh, the data, the size of the data must agree between sends and receives, uh, and there is an optional argument in the case of two-dimensional arrays. The semantics is the usual, uh, uh, is the usual MPI. Uh, the, the, the send operation is locally blocking, uh, so the, uh, the, the data gets copied into a buffer and you can reuse it immediately. The receive operation is globally blo blocking and you have to wait for its completion to, to proceed in your, uh, in your computations. Uh, we do have a collective operations. Uh, again, they are defined for multiple data types. Uh, uh, for all the data types where it makes sense, uh, for instance, uh, 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 we have absolute maximum and absolute minimum, absolute value maximum and absolute value minimum, which makes sense for all data precisions, uh, whereas maximum and minimum don't make sense uh, for uh, complex data, and so they are not defined on complex data. Uh, that this is uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, obvious, sh should be fairly obvious. Okay, uh, this is the uh, the broadcast. So, uh, as usual, like we all know what the broadcast is. The only important thing is that we are not reinventing the wheel. We are reusing the MPI collective, so we are as efficient as the underlying MPI implementation is. Uh, same things uh, for the uh, for the C interface, where, however, we also have to add uh, this. Uh, letter to distinguish between the various precisions uh, because we can the C compiler will not distinguish uh, those precision in, uh, from a generic interface because it's not capable of doing that. Okay. Uh, and again the the usual sum the usual reductions like the sum reduction operation uh, which relies on uh, on MPI. So here you have the a, a, a very quick exercise. What is an extravagantly expensive way to compute the sum of the first n square n square in, uh, of the uh, natural numbers? Uh, now, obviously, we all know that uh, uh, this sum can be computed by a simple formula. Uh, there is no need to actually execute the sum, but if you want to waste a few machine cycles, uh, you can implement uh, this. Uh, this code here, which will generate the uh, the square of the current uh, of the current uh, <clears throat> of the of the of the 
of the task index, and then we will sum all of the uh, all of the values uh, in into a total sum, which is then uh, printed out here. Uh, actually, this slide does not quite the same thing as the as the formula that you can see here. And if you want uh, to think a little bit about why, uh, I don't know. Do you want? Um, there is a very simple answer actually as to why this is not doing exactly the same thing. Any guesses? There are no guesses. So I will keep, uh, I will point out that uh, the task index uh, is inherited from MPI. So it goes from zero to NP minus one, which means that uh, the, this sum here is written as sum from k equals 1 to n, whereas this sum here is from 0 to n minus 1. And that's, and that's the reason why there is a slight mismatch into, into, into this uh, exercise. OK, the computational kernels that we are going to, uh, to implement. Uh, let's look at the matrix vector product. Uh, we are going to deal with the parallel sparse matrix by vector product, which is in, in turn a special case of the, the parallel matrix vector product. And the problem is that uh, in dealing with the matrix vector product is that you have a local matrix here, you have your, your, your matrix here, and you need to collect the values of the uh, of the vector that you're multiplying by uh, from re potentially from remote processors like you can you have this communication here and this communication here uh, now uh, because we are dealing with the sparse matrix uh, you don't need all of this uh, data you only need a subset of them because there is only a subset of coefficients that are non zero and the data setup and management uh, uh, and support routine uh, are uh, geared towards uh, building a, a, an exchange that is as efficient as possible in dealing with this uh, particular uh, operator. Um, okay, so this is uh, what we are uh, we are going to deal with. Notice also that I, as as yet, I have said nothing about. Uh, what is the data structure that is uh, that is employed to store the sparse matrix uh, into your local computer and uh, that's also uh, another aspect that we are going to uh, that i'm going to touch a little bit uh, and you can find it in, it's described in very clear detail in, uh, in some of the references that are provided at the end of the presentation um, what is another necessary ingredient is a uh, a sparse triangular system solution you have a here we have a sparse triangular system which has been obtained uh, i don't know by splitting a sparse matrix for a gauss seidel iteration or by employing an incomplete factorization uh, for a block jacobi type of preconditioner and uh, this is the uh, this is the <clears throat> elimination tree that you have for this particular uh, kind of, uh, of uh, matrix. Uh, and uh, so we do support the sparse triangular system solutions with uh, one caveat uh, that we will exploit, uh, we'll explain later. Then we have the usual dot products uh, for, for uh, obviously on distributed vectors norms of vectors, the usual ones, the norm one, norm two, and norm infinity, and then the uh, matrix norms, uh, the usual uh, one norm and infinity norm. We do not provide the two norm because it is so expensive to compute for a, uh, that for a, uh, an iterative solver, it is uh, rarely uh, employed. And then we have AXP-like uh, uh, vector sums. Uh, which are ext actually extended with two parameters. Uh, as you can see here, this is the AXP uh, uh, extension where we do both an alpha in front of X and the beta in front of Y so that we can have any combination of the two. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, here we have the triangular 
system solution where we are assuming that that t is both triangular and block diagonal where the block on the diagonal corresponds to the part of the matrix that's stored on any given process which means that we are looking at a uh, we are really geared towards a block jacobi or a hybrid gauss seidel uh, type of preconditioner that's the kind of things that we support by default okay uh, you can also specify the transpose uh, for the matrix vector product and the triangular system solve of the two, the triangular system solve transpose is, shall we say, relatively easy, but the transpose of the matrix vector product is uh, rather heavier because it requires a communication in a different order. So uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is not very common uh, uh, to use it, although it is uh, used in some uh, in some either solvers like in the biconjugate uh, uh, gradient method. Uh, all of these routines have their C counterpart, which is uh, which is described here, uh, and so you can employ you can employ them to ex to exactly implement exactly the same algorithms, and uh, all of, uh, and with with the same variants. Okay, so we also have the transpose variant. And all of this was done to arrive at this way of writing the conjugate gradient or indeed any other Krilov based methods. So you have a one to one correspondence between the template and well, an almost one to one correspondence between the template and the implementation. Uh, in this case here, I'm calling uh, this block Jacobi type of iteration directly. But in actual, in an actual code, I would build a preconditioner object and invoke the application of the preconditioner object onto the z vector. So that would be even closer to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the to to the writing that we have in the template. Okay, uh, and uh, if you. If you have seen all of the previous kernels, it should be very fairly easy to write the equivalent C code for uh, for this same uh, for this same kernel that we are looking at here, uh, because you can uh, you can have a one to one correspondence between each and every call. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the data distribution. How do you build those matrices in parallel? Uh, the guiding principle is obviously the owner computes, which means that every uh, every uh, entry in the index space has a home process that will be responsible for doing the computation for that uh, for that index. Which also means that a given process is responsible to uh, make sure that uh, the entry in the output vector y is computed by that process. Uh, and you also have you also need to handle the mapping between global and local processes, uh, keeping in mind that you have some indices which are local to a certain process, and some indices that some indices that are totally separate from a certain process, and some indices that fall in between. They are indices that live on other processes but are needed on the current one to compute the value of the matrix vector product. Those indices that you need to gather. To, to, to do the multiplication. These are called the hollow indices. Uh, and usually uh, we employ a mesh partition, which is obviously uh, equivalent to a graph partition uh, problem. Uh, graph partitioning is NP complete, and we uh, had no intention uh, to, uh, to write uh, yet another uh, graph partitioner ourselves. Uh, in fact, we uh, encourage the people to reuse uh, uh, graph partitioners available uh, on, on, uh, on the net. We do have a ready-made interface with Metis, but really you can build an interface to any graph partitioner you like. Okay, uh, great. So, uh, the interesting thing is the use of this the communicator descriptor, which is used to implement this PSB hollow exchange. As I mentioned, this is a persistent neighbor all to all variable all to all exchange, and it is the key 
communication kernel in any uh, any uh, Krilo method application because it is a, the communication step that is executed at every uh, matrix vector product. And as it turns out, if you are also uh, updating the local uh, your local field with certain stencils, it is also exactly the same operator that you need to uh, to up, to update your local field. So this can be uh, this comes in two versions. The Fortran version is a generic one. For the C version, I'm only using here the double precision variant. But obviously, you have uh, the integer, uh, single precision, or complex versions. Uh, so the descriptor contains a bunch of stuff, something like this. Uh, and uh, so we have here an index map, which is a, a, an object that uh, maps uh, local indices to global indices and vice versa. Uh, and also there are a, a few other data structures that, are, that contain the exchange lists for those hollow operations. So the index map uh, can be built in a number of ways. So how do you distribute uh, uh, Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is a, an example of a hollow exchange operation in which uh, these data here, the data associated with these mesh points here has to be sent to process one, and the data associated with these mesh points here has to be sent to process zero. And this is exactly what happens after a call to, the, to PSB hollow, because these ghost values on process zero have been updated with copies of the entries in process one and vice versa, so that you can <coughs> you can proceed with uh, with uh, with your computation. Now, um, sparse matrices. You can have a matrix uh, stored in coordinate uh, storage format, or you can uh, which is written like uh, this, and the code for the matrix vector product is shown uh, down here. Or you can have compressed storage by rows, also known as CSR, and the code is here. Or you can have other uh, other uh, kinds of uh, storage formats. And if you are unsure what you uh, need to use, then uh, so be reassured that, that we are doubtful ourselves. We don't know which is the best one. The problem is that uh, data structures uh, uh, vary in their efficiency uh, between operations and between uh, archi computer architectures. And both of them vary at the same time. So what we really want to do, uh, we would ideally like to choose the data structure at the latest possible moment uh, at runtime not only that, but we also want to switch between the one data storage uh, and another at runtime if it is convenient. Now, our library is capable of doing this uh, by employing a certain kind of, uh, uh, of, of uh, <coughs> design technique. We use a design pattern that's called the state design pattern. And it is detail, uh, the details of this implementation are in the papers that you can find in the references at the end of the presentation. This design pattern also means that we can uh, plug into our library uh, very easily variations on those for storage formats, including variations that are suited for GPUs. And in fact, we do have a GPU plugin that you can employ. And you can see here the kind of performance that we can get on various NVIDIA GPUs. We can reach up to 110 gigaflops on a Volta V100. That's the latest I have measured. On the, on the Pascal P100 that are available on, for instance, on PSDINT, you can reach over 70 gigaflops for a large enough matrix. Uh, and these things are handled transparently by our code. Okay, data management. As we discussed before, we have to set up a descriptor and we have to set up a sparse matrix. So the first step is to design the association between uh, processes and indices. 
you are distributing an index space onto various processes. And we had identified uh, essentially three major ways uh, to, to assign pro indices to processes. The first major way is uh, to say that each index should go to one process. So you have a list uh, for every index, you know which process it should belong to. The second way is to say uh, on each process, you have these indices. A special case of the second case of the second way of assigning indices is when on each process you say uh, you get this bunch of consecutive indices. So you are essentially cutting your index space into stripes and you assign one consecutive and contiguous stripe to every process. And then we have a another another way, a sort of a catch-all where you can specify any crazy strategy that you can think of, including uh, you can uh, you can even specify a random data distribution, which is obviously not recommended for performance reasons. But we you, we actually use the random allocation of indices uh, in, during the testing phase, and the library is capable of handling that. It's not very efficient. Uh, it's uh, absolutely slow, but it works. Okay, so. These, uh, these three styles. In the first style, you have a vector here that says for each and every index in your index space, you know where that index uh, goes into, uh, on, on, on which process it goes. And this argument must be the same on all processes. This is not a scalable solution because you would have to have a vector that is of the same size as the global index space on every process. This is not very scalable, but it is useful for, uh, for simple cases. A scalable solution would be this one, where on each process, you only need to pass a vector with uh, just the indices that are going to end up on that process. And again, as I said, the special case of this is the case where you, uh, you are uh, identifying this vector with a bunch of consecutive indices. And then on each process, you have the number of consecutive indices that you are going to, to employ. Uh, so this is the first version. The first version is suitable if you're using a serial uh, graph partitioner like Metis. You build the graph partitioner somewhere, you broadcast it, and then you pass to all to the allocation uh, to the initialization routine. Um, okay. The, um, the second is to have a list of locally owned indices. Uh, in this case, there is no requirement that the indices should be contiguous. They can jump all over the place. Uh, there is no problem with that. Uh, they do not need to be ordered. Uh, it can, they can uh, come into a random order. Uh, it's a, it, it works just the same. And the global size is the sum of the individual sizes on all the processes of those lists of indices. Again, you can do this with the C interface as well. And this is the uh, declaration that you, that you need for, 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 for that operation. Uh, Finally, you can do a bunch of contiguous indices. And uh, again, these need not be uh, distributed evenly. Uh, they can change from one process to the next. Again, the C interface. Finally, in the Fortran interface, you have a you can define a subroutine that defines a completely arbitrary strategy. Whatever you put inside that subroutine will work, and it's up to you to make sure that it works. So at the end of this, we have part of the global of the overall mapping because we have defined the mapping between the local numbering and the global number such that you have a global number, a global index i, which gets transformed into a pair process and local index. Okay. However, you do not know which entries you should handle in your hollow. And uh, Okay, and and this is uh, and this is an important thing. So this uh, this uh, build of the of the halo can go into two steps. The first step is, if you do have some information on the 
uh, on the uh, topological connections between processes, you can say that a given process is a neighbor of another process. This is not, uh, uh, this is not mandatory, but it can speed up some phases of the, of the computation. And the second step is to build the, the detail, the fine level mesh topology, uh, detailing which index uh, is connected to which other index. This can be done explicitly if you specify a list of edges, or it can be done implicitly because the list of edges is actually the, the pattern of a sparse matrix. So if you're building a sparse matrix, you are implicitly building a, 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 dis a distributed mesh. So this is the uh, first way of dealing with the, the insertion of the indices. And those indices are written usually in the global numbering at the application level. And it is the task of the library to convert them into local numbering. You don't need to know the, uh, sorry. Uh, oh gosh. You don't need to do it yourself. Uh, gosh. Here we go. OK. So we have the Fortran version and the C version uh, for the, of the same thing. And finally, uh, we need to perform some post-processing on, uh, on the descriptor to bring it into the assembled state. And then you can use it for the computation. So you have a setup phase. Uh, uh, an initialization phase, a uh, mesh build phase, uh, a post-processing phase, and then you can call your uh, iterative method. In the same way, you can have a sparse matrix. Uh, you start with the allocation of a sparse matrix, uh, and, uh, and then you begin to uh, put entries into the sparse matrix. So. The only thing that you need to know is uh, you need to write a representation of your matrix essentially in coordinate format. Uh, and then internally at the end, uh, at the end of this loop, which is again in uh, Fortran and C version, at the end of this loop, you have a post-processing uh, uh, version in which you can bring your matrix into to use a certain format or a mold. Format, for instance, you can say CSR, or you can say, let's say, LPAC or whatever, if it is supported. And then there is this mold argument, which allows you to develop your own format and plug it into the library, even if the library doesn't know what your format looks like. As long as your format conforms to the interface, you can pass it to the library and then the library will use it. And indeed, this is the way in which we handle GPUs. We have some external plugins, external modules for the sparse matrices onto the GPU, and we pass them to the libraries through this mechanism. Uh, same, the same uh, assembly, the same assembly and post-processing step you have in the C interface. Obviously, uh, it has to be done the same way. And there is, are some post-processing options uh, for dealing with repeated entries. Uh, repeated entries may happen uh, in, for instance, in finite element applications in which you are intend you intend to sum all of the repeated entries together because they are partial contributions or you can have final differences where a repeated entry is really uh, not relevant or you can choose to treat them as an as a mistake an error okay sometimes sometimes you are dealing with with an, iter a, an outer iteration a non-linear iteration uh, that such that your discretization mesh is the same, but the coefficients are changed. In this case, you can restart the whole process by putting the matrix in an update state, and then you can uh, and then you can rebuild the, the matrix. But because you are only updating the coefficients, you save some work on the structure of the matrix itself. Okay. Same code structure for, for uh, dense vectors. Uh, again, you will need to specify the global index of the entry and the value, and it will be stored inside the appropriate data structure. 
Uh, okay, so this is uh, again translated into C into the C code in the interface that you can see down here. Um, there are some uh, rules of precedence for building your application. We will skip over this because you can look at them into in uh, our example programs that are quite extensive. Uh, and uh, so this is basically the uh, the way you set up your your data. There are some auxiliary routines that help you in translating global to local and local to global uh, vectors. They come into variants, uh, into a, an in-place variant and an out-of-place variant. So you can uh, um, you can translate between global and local indices uh, uh, as you wish. And there are some auxiliary routines that you can employ in certain cases if you want to. Okay, uh, utilities, if you want to debug uh, with uh, matrices that are stored on file, for instance, from the sweet sparse uh, the matrix collection uh, and the matrices in the sweet part are written in the hardware Boeing or in the matrix market format. And here are some interfaces to read and write data from file uh, in those formats. So let's now go to the precondition iterations. We have a single entry point, which is called PSB Krilov. And PSB Krilov takes as argument the description of the method that you want to use. We have by CG stub, by CG, uh, uh, CGS, GMRES, uh, the conjugate gradient, the flexible conjugate gradient, uh, and uh, which is uh, pretty much most of the methods that uh, you find in the literature today. And if you need a new method, you can easily uh, take one of the implementations of these methods and clone it into a different uh, uh, into, into a different uh, uh, subroutine. Uh, it takes the sparse matrix object, the preconditioner object, which we will see in a moment, uh, the right hand side B, the initial guess and final result X, the tolerance you want to specify, the descriptor of the uh, communication uh, data, and, uh, and you add an information, an output, uh, an output value uh, ch check for uh, uh, possible errors in return. There are some optional arguments that you can specify uh, so that you can have more precise control over what you are doing. Uh, these, is, these are the description of the optional arguments. Um, but I, I will uh, notice that we have two, right now we have two stopping criteria. The, the usual two norm of the relative residual is the default. But in some cases, uh, it, it can be better to specify the first, uh, uh, the first stopping criteria. Uh, the C interface obviously takes uh, the, uh, the, it comes in four variants depending on the data type that you're dealing with and everything else uh, is uh, is absolutely the same uh, except that there are no optional arguments in c so we have a solver options structure with some default solver option initialization with which is provided by this uh, by this function here okay Preconditioners are, are uh, defined with a uh, type declaration. Uh, you initialize a precondition and then you build it uh, uh, based on the current matrix. And as I mentioned, in the PS Plus library, we'd on, we only have uh, three, really three kinds of preconditioners, uh, no preconditioning, diagonal scaling, and block Jacobi with ELU and ELU, okay, so this is uh, one of the things that's going to change in version 3.7. We are going to, to support natively ILU of N and also some variants of the approximate inverse preconditioner like INVK of N and M, okay? So this, uh, these are the kind of preconditions that are native to, to PS Plus. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the next presentation will be all about algebraic multigrid preconditioners, and in that, uh, which is the core of the research that's being carried out in the context of the ECO project, uh, which is, and it is the subject of the next presentation. Uh, so, 
you can use the test directory and the examples in the file read the folder. So they come, they come in two versions. Uh, they, they generate the matrix on the fly or they read the matrix from file. Obviously, reading the matrix from file is a bottleneck, but it can be useful to, if you want to check the numerical properties on certain classes of matrices. But definitely, if you really want to have a benchmark program, it should generate the matrix on the fly within the application. Uh, the test program in the PARGEN application is built to, to handle a uh, two or three dimensional uh, in, in, the, in the version 3.7, you have a two or three dimensional uh, uh, problem on the, on the unit cube. Uh, it is discretized with Dirichlet boundary conditions and you can specify the individual, uh, the individual functions so that you can emulate uh, either a pure Poisson problem or an advection diffusion uh, problem or any combination thereof. Uh, so you have a, a great flexibility in testing uh, your, uh, your, uh, your program. And uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the set of references. And as I mentioned, uh, the description of how we handle the switch between different variants of the storage format is described here. Uh, and uh, it is also expanded in uh, this uh, in this methodology paper here and in this review paper here where we discuss uh, some 70 different formats uh, uh, for uh, sparse matrices on GPUs. Uh, so I would recommend you, if you are dealing with GPUs, I would recommend you uh, read the, this paper to, to get acquainted with the, the literature and with the software that's available out, out, over, out there. Uh, this is, okay, so this is the paper that's been published on the previous version of the algebraic multi-grid preconditioner. We now have a, an update of that uh, paper, which is being submitted to, uh, to SIAM SciComp. And it's currently under a review. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Fabio will uh, give you the detail uh, later on. And that is all I had to say uh, right now. Uh, and if there are any questions, I will be happy to, uh, uh, to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Okay, questions open before the next uh, uh, the, the tutorials. Uh, if I may add one comment. Uh, in the next presentation, you will see that we, we have used uh, this software framework. <clears throat> uh, on on Pitsdient, we have run a few benchmarks where we have reached uh, uh, something like uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 10th uh, sizes. Uh, the matrix size was uh, 2.7 times 10 to the 10th. And we've been able to solve these problems in a few seconds uh, on, on, on a substantial partition of, uh, of, uh, of, of piece diet. And this data will be presented in, in the next, uh, in the next uh, section. Thank you. Thank you, Salvatore. So if there is no questions, I think we can start uh, the the presentation about the results and how it works, the demonstration. So this presentation will be done by Fabio, right? Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, do, do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
Okay, let's start. Let's start again from where Salvatore left us. So I'm going to present you briefly how the MG for PS Plus package of uh, preconditioner works. So the motivation is the one you, <laughs> you have already listened to extensively until now. So we have to solve linear system of very large dimension. This is a critical uh, step in scientific application and uh, they can range and they can come both from numerical simulation of uh, physics problem that are the one in which we are most involved in the ECHO project or they can come from, uh, let's say more recent type of problems like network analysis, community detection and stuff like that. So this is, this is a critical part of scientific uh, computation. So I don't think I have to convince you. So what we want to, to obtain is a, a performant way of solving uh, this type of system for sparse matrices, so matrices in which the number of non-zero elements is proportional to the size. And the go-to algorithm are Kreloff iterative methods, as that were already mentioned by Salvatore. But uh, as you surely know, Kreloff iterative methods do depend on eigenvalue at least for symmetric matrices on eigenvalues distribution for the convergence. So in general, the matrices that you'll get from your application won't be good enough to achieve good convergence properties. So you may be in a case like this one in which to get some, some convergence behavior you need to do a lots of iteration. These are way more than the one we would like to do. So what one usually do is to change the problem into another that is more amenable to the solution with Krill of subspace methods, but that has clearly the same solution of the original problem. And this procedure is called uh, preconditioning. So in the context of uh, large parallel computers, what we want to have are preconditioner that are good mathematical properties so that they are able of making the spectral distribution independent on the sides of the problem. Was action does, co does cost like a matrix vector product, so, or a few matrix vector products, so, it has to cost as little as possible. And since we want to do them in parallel, it has to be made of local action. And this is what we call implementation scalability. Uh, a go-to technique to have all these, uh, to have all these properties, or at least a reasonable, uh, uh, quantity of them or a reasonable satisfaction of them is multividagons. They do show optimal behavior for many symmetric positive definite matrices. For example, matrices coming from scalar leak TPDEs or system of scalar leak TPDEs. But what we usually will have to do would be having a trade off between the optimality and velocity. So sometimes we will have to lose something in algorithmic scalability to get the fastest preconditioner that is what we actually want. So what are the main issues that we, we encounter in, uh, in facing this challenge? Well, clearly we have to leverage on using the single parallel nodes at the best of our possibilities. So we need to achieve single processor performance and up at least an optimal memory of 
occupation. And then we need to be able to balance between computation and communication cost. Uh, this we, package I'm going to talk about is built on top of PS Plus, so as the name suggests. So it has also to inherit the constraints that are given, you know, that we select for PS Blast, and that's what Salvatore told about. So we need to stay flexible, stiff with maintain a wider applicability and be able of reusing the most of the standard library. So for the one of you that does not know what the multi-grid algorithm uh, is let me just try to summarize it uh, to summarize it so a multi-grid algorithm is nothing more than a simple combination of uh, iterative methods that works at different scales the, the idea stems up from uh, the following observation there are certain methods that certain simple methods that we call smoother that are slow do converge slow on the solution of our linear system, but that does not converge slow everywhere. So they can, they are able to abate the error fast in certain frequency and slowly in another. So what one usually do is interlacing uh, the stationary smoother with a projection with a projection and correction scheme so that one can build a hierarchy of system in which at each step the smoother works well and where the smoother doesn't work well the prolongator or let's say the restriction and the correction is able to reduce the error so this is what one usually means when speaks about complementarity of uh, smoothers and prolongators in to be more specific, in our case, uh, we deal with what are called algebraic multigrid methods. So these are methods that does not use explicitly the geometry of the problem, maybe because the geometry is uh, very complex and very hard to leverage on. Or if you think about the network problem I told briefly in, in the introduction, the well, may not be a geometry to leverage. So even the concept of having a smooth error in certain frequencies have to be recasted into a pure algebraic properties. And so this means that the vectors on uh, which the smooth iteration works well have to be in the range on the coarse grid and then well interpolated back. And this can be formulated in a pure algebraic way. So by looking only at the entries of the matrix. So what's the general, uh, the general framework? Well, this is nothing but the recursive application of a two grid scheme, let's say at least in, uh, in theory, while in practice we are not actually implementing any recursion, but just for understanding what we are doing. So one has to set up the selected smoother that will usually be a simple stationary iterative method, so let's say a block Jacobi and hybrid Gauss Seidel, uh, something on, on this fashion. Then set up a coarse vector space, build the prolongator, and then compute the coarse matrix. If we are coarse enough, we solve. Otherwise, we Applicated recursively, we build a new smoother and so on and so forth. We implement uh, two main strategies for uh, the stepping green. So, for the build of the coarsening and the build of the prolongator, one is the AMG based on Vanek, uh, Mandel, and Berzina aggregation. This was inherited from the previous version of the of the package. And uh, what does it do is in the end, it builds a piecewise constant prolongator and uh, builds the aggregates via a decoupled aggregation uh, scheme. 
This has the good properties of being embarrassingly parallel, but it needs some inputs from the from the user, namely it needs to be inputted the strength of connection to deal to know how to evaluate how to evaluate and build the aggregates. Generally, it's good properties on the scalar PDs until you use a moderate number of, uh, of cores. The core of the, new of the new developments of the library we had gone through is in, instead based on uh, using, uh, let's say, a completely automatic way of doing the coarsening and aggregation that is based on graph matching. So we start from the graph associated with the sparse matrices, produce a maximum weighted matchings. These produce coupled pair aggregates. And these are now the aggregates on which we reduce our problem. Observe that this is in a way completely automatic. Uh, moreover, to, we can be more aggressive, so we can join together more than one single sweep of matching to have aggregates that are made of two, four, eight, and so on, original nodes. And we can increase the robustness by using not simply a piecewise constant as a prolongator by a smoothing prolongator that increases its regularity and does makes for a more robust algorithm. If we do a comparison of the two strategies we implement, we clearly the matching based aggregation lose, loses the being embarrassingly parallel, but we do implement uh, methods that are capable of doing the matching in, uh, in parallel with some performances. And the cost we pay in this aggregation phase pay, pays in having uh, course matrices that are well balanced and not to not avoid needing special treatment of processor bounds. And more importantly, permits us to work with discretized system of PDEs, so from with matrices that are more general than the one for which the decoupled aggregation uh, works. It has the drawback that, and this is something which we are working on, that it may have problem with very with highly anisotropic problems due to the incapacity of the matching to work in parallel in this setting. Let's look a little bit more into the, the library. As I was saying, and as Salvatore already said, it does improve on the previous version of the package that was initially developed for uh, algebraic multigrid sparse preconditioner and extended to some of the MG features during uh, ECO1. Since it is built on top of PS Plus, it does inherit all the object-oriented design from, from it. And uh, there is, okay, it's, a clear separation between the interfaces and implementation of the methods. This permits to a relatively easy build extension for the library. So like, for example, if you want to build your uh, a news motor, it's relatively easily to do so. And it separates the interface for, set, for doing the setup of the multigrid hierarchy and the smoothers. This means, for instance, that if you have a sequence of linear system, you can decide to reuse the same hierarchy and just rebuild this motor for the new matrices. So saving up part of the work. It does have a plugin for GPU exploitation at the moment, the, only for the application. And we are working in uh, doing also the build phase on the GPUs. And it has also the same C, the analogous interface with the one we have seen, and uh, also an interface for Octave from which you can uh, play around. In a, a more diagrammatic way, so if <laughs> there is uh, the software layer that is PS Blast that Salvatore showed you, then we have the 
extension library. For the smoothers, we also have the interfaces to some external library that can be used. For example, you can select the block Jacobi method and solve the block with the super layu code or with maps or with UMF pack, or you can use them also as course solver if you, let's say that you have course enough to use a super layu distributed solution. So as I was saying, we do implement uh, many strategies for uh, in the library. So we implement most of the classical type of multi-grid cycle. So V, W, and K cycle. Uh, we have L1 uh, methods like L1 Jacobi, L1 hybrid forward, backward, outsider. This is all uh, the hybrid stays for the caveats that Salvatore mentioned that for us, triangular solution means always block diagonal and triangulars on the block. Block Jacobi, additive parts with uh, LU, uh, ELU factorization on the sparse approximate inverses that Salvatore was mentioning. And these are particularly important for uh, GPU applications because they just need matrix vector products. Then for the quartz matrix solver, you can use practically every smoother I've told before, I've told you before, or a sparse approach or a, a, another iterative method with its own preconditioner. So you can do it in a sort of recursive way. And also we have the interface I mentioned just a few slides ago that can be used to solve the courses linear system. Let me show you how these, uh, how these work. After that, you have uh, defined your preconditioner object. You can, uh, you have to init it by telling it what type of preconditioner do you want to use? Is it a block Jacobi? Is it a multigrid? Is it a, an additive Schwartz? The parallel context, and this just does the init. Then after you have selected the type, you need to set all the option I've mentioned. So for example, you can set, uh, let's say the smoother to be Jacobi on uh, level three and four, or gauss Seidel on level uh, five and six, or just set the same one on every level. So this routine permits you pretty much to set whatever combination of the pieces you can think of. Then you have the separate build phase for the multi, for the multi grid type of preconditioner. So you first build hierarchy and then build these motors. Otherwise, you can either call the build on the whole preconditioner and this, if it is a multi grid, it will call inside first the hierarchy and then the smoother. If it is a block Jacobi or the nutty disparse, then you can just call this one and it does the correct build. Then this is when Salvatore showed you the implementation for the CG, told you that there was hard coded the solution with the hem and then matrices, but in reality, you would have an apply phase and that's the apply routine that would be happening there. So this is completely transparent from uh, the point of view of the implementation of the iterative methods. So you just, if you want to implement another iterative method that needs a preconditioner, you just have to put here and apply and everything is done behind the scene. And after you have done using it, you then just free it. Or if you want to see on screen what happens, you just call the descriptor on P and this will print out that to screen information what you're on what you have actually built. 
So how does this part of the codes look like? Well, you have your sparse matrices, then uh, you may want to have it on the GPU. So you define also the sparse matrices on the GPU. You have the descriptor that Salvatore told about. Then you have the preconditioner object. You init all the, you init the PS plus, do all the build phase about what I showed you. And then you have arrived at the point in which you can call the construction of the preconditioner. So you init it, you set all the attributes you want, you do the hierarchy build, these motor builds. In particular, if you want to do the application on GPU, you pass it here, the GPU data types. And then at this point, it does know that you have to work on the GPU. You can print out a description of the preconditioner screen, then uh, do the conversion on GPU, assembly, uh, assembly everything, and call your Krill of methods. And that's the general framework on how an application is, uh, is built. Just to give you a few examples. For example, if you want to do a multigrid, you init an ML preconditioner, you say that uh, you want to do the smoother is block Jacobi, the course solve is block Jacobi, and the number of sweep to do of block Jacobi to do on the course grid are eight. And then it does build everything. So as you said, we haven't said anything about how to solve the block. And this will make the library goes to its own default. And you can read about them on the, let's say on the, on the manual. So you can be lazy and don't tell the library how to solve the block. Or another type of observation of a combination is you build again a multigrid. This time you told, you tell it, to build the W cycle, to use FDGS, to do two sweeps of smoother, uh, because it is maybe is less robust than block Jacobi. And now to use the S course solver MAMS. So since MAMS is a distributed solver, you have also to say to the, to the library that the course matrix has to stay distributed among the processes. And then you do the hierarchy build, the smoother builds, and everything goes the same. And this is exactly the analogous if you want to do a, an added, a restricted additive bars. You set the type to additive bars, the number of levels of overlap, do the build, and use it. Now I'll try uh, showing you for a second a console just to let you look at how these things work. So this is the folder in which I have installed the, the library. If you go to the samples, you find uh, all the samples that we, we deliver with the library. So let's say that we want to do, to look at the, case in which we generate a scalar PDs. So you will find here all the modules. If you type make, it compiles all the test cases. Then inside the run, you will find the compiled version. And for example, for the default case, you run it this way. Aha, and obviously, if I take the correct name of the file, it's better. And let me show you what does 
what did it print out? So I launched it on this test file, then I'm gonna show you what is inside it. It does the generation, tells you how much time spent in allocation, coefficient generation, description assembly, math assembly, and so on. Tells you what test problem you are solving. And then uses a BICG stub to solve the associated linear system and prints out the multi-level precondition that it has built. So it is a multi-level with hybrid forward gauss seidel preconditioner. It has used three levels with this average operator complexity, two pre and two post smooth sweeps. And it has used the decoupled aggregation without filtering and smoothed. Then you get information on the level. So damping values, aggregation threshold, and so on. These are specific to the, to the type of algorithm. And then tells you what you have done on the course level for the, for the solution. So we have done a block Yakub sweep of block Jacobi with one with an incomplete factorization with one level of fields, and then print out a, a summary of the of all the performances. If we look at the at the input file, it just contains. Uh, the type of uh, algorithm you can use. So for example, it says that you are setting up a multi bit preconditioner, then you write here the, the query for the smoother, the number of sweeps, uh, further option if you have been using instead of the FBGS, the additive parts, the inf k if you have been using here a block Jacobi and so on. So you can pretty much play around with all the parameters, set up the type of cycle, the, what was the view cy v cycle, the number of sweeps, uh, the type of aggregation, and so on. So you can look at the manual and pretty much use this to play around with all the, the possible variants of, uh, of the library. Um, if you look in the folders, there is also a file read folder that instead contains uh, the possibility of running all the algorithms on a matrix and the right hand side that are taken from a matrix market format. So you can also try to see if the stuff that is in the library works for your problem before implementing everything in the library language. So these were to toy problems. So let me show you instead uh, a couple of more realistic applications that since they are larger, I cannot show them. <laughs> real time. So the first case I wanna show you is a weak scalability on piece date in which I show you, I've shown you on the example, the whole aggregation scheme. Now these are examples with the new aggregation based on graph matchings. So without going too much into the detail, it's a smoothed boost cycle. Uh, okay, if I show, if I just show you the graph, maybe it's much more clear. So what we are doing is solving the Poisson benchmark. So it is the standard Poisson equation with these amounts of degree of freedoms by having a weak scalability. So each one of the curve does correspond to a number of DOF per core. So the green curve is the one with the higher number of DOFs. The one with the triangles are running on CPU, while the one with the circles are running on the GPUs. 
And as you can see, we can solve systems that are up to 10 to the 10 unknowns in few in less than 10 seconds on the GPU. What is particularly relevant is that in this machine, 2048 GPUs use fewer no is way fewer nodes than the one that are needed to use to 27,000 uh, core. So this means that we have a comparable solution time by using way less resources. So this is a, a gain in, uh, in the energy spent, in the actual energy spent in solving the, the system. But we are come on the core of the ECHO project is uh, also the application to realistic uh, test cases. So this is uh, from uh, a joint work with Herbert Owen from the BSG that is, we are currently working on it. So these are preliminary results for this test problem. This is uh, a large head uh, simulation of Navier Stokes simulating the wine profile on this uh, hill in Denmark. This is a quite, this is a, a relevant benchmark for this type of problems. So what we do here is uh, we focus on the solution of the pressure equation. So this is a time independent problem. So we need to solve it on subsequent time steps. And what do we do is that we build the preconditioner for the first time step and then just reuse it for, uh, for the other. So we don't, we don't do any update or any recomputation. It's just a frozen preconditioner. Uh, and let me show you what does happens, what does happen in this case. So the violet line is the deflated CG that is implemented in Alia by default. This is the BSC software. And as you may see, the, as you go up with the number of cores, the quality of the solution, the quality of the solution deteriorates. So it takes at each new sides more and more iteration to converge. While on the other end, all the all our strategies, all the strategies implemented in uh, MG for PS Blast are pretty much constant in the number of iteration. And this when one could say, well, yes, you are constant, but maybe you cost a lot more than the deflated CG. Well, this is not actually the case. We have also a good average solution time. So the fact that, yes, we are weightier than the deflated CG because we need also to build the preconditioner at the beginning, but in the solving phase, there is still an advantage in, uh, in using the strategy I presented you. So by the end of the project, the new release of Alia will have directly the possibility of using this preconditioner inside. So we are proceeding with the integration also in uh, Kinsol by the Lawrence Livermore National Lab that in turn will be, is it a piece of power flow? And this will permit us also to solve the linear system coming from uh, quasi-Newton method. So also to solve a uh, system with the Jacobian matrices. And uh, we are still working on uh, implementing new smoothers and uh, especially new building algorithm for smoothers on GPUs. And uh, we are trying to deal with the drawback 
I told you before in the matching algorithms that is uh, treating kindly anisotropic problem. And this is still at, at the moment a theoretical work to find uh, a way to do multi-objective uh, optimization for the matching to solve for this problem. The, I'm pretty much done. I just tell you that the manuscript Salvatore was referring to with the information on the scaling uh, that is submitted to CISC is this one. So yes, it's March, 2020. CISC takes, does takes a very long time in doing the revision. So we are waiting for the second round. But you can already read the results for the scalability and the combination of, uh, of the pieces in the archive preprint, while these are the other version. These are the theoretical analysis and uh, information on the previous version of the, of the package. And I think I am done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, so if there are some questions, please. Right. So personally, I have a small question concerning Powerflow. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have already done some tests with the last uh, GPU version of Powerflow combining uh, Powerflow and your GPU version? Uh, no, we have still we have still not done it. So at the, the stage at which the integration is now, we have built an extension of Kinsol using uh, all the CPU stuff in PS Blast. So I don't know if you are. So Kinsol does work by having its own interfaces for matrices and vector. So we created the interfaces for matrices and vector that are on the CPU side. The CPU is, uh, we have yet. Okay, so the first, the first step is to try it with on the CPU? Yeah, the first step is trying to so now Parflow uses uh, a version of uh, of Hyper-A via Petsy. So we mm -hmm. want to start looking at being competitive on the CPU and then move to the <laughs> to the GPU. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the for the question. Okay, let's check as well. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yes, Jose, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, ha I have uh, two small questions. Uh, the first one is if your AMG, uh, does it support uh, uh, like vector value, uh, uh, like for vector, pro uh, vector value PDE? Can, yeah. I, can, I, can I run like AMG like in a, Per component? Uh, yes, okay. So uh, if you have discrete, you, if you have a representation of the matrix in the PS Blast, uh, let's say format as Salvatore was describing, then you can apply the um, multi grid on it. We have, uh, I would particularly recommend in that case to use the AMG based on the graph matching because we have some experience with it working with vector valued uh, PDs, both in DOF numbering. So let's say that you numbers your equation by DOF, let's say pressure, temperature, velocity for DOF one, and then pressure, temperature, velocity for DOF2 and so on. And we have also tried it with the 
big block formulation. So first I discretize all pressure, then all uh, temperature and so on. And it seems to, to work. So yeah, that's surely something you can, uh, you can try. Okay, thanks. And, and second, have you, have you, okay. I, I, I would expect that it will work, but uh, uh, anyway, I pose the question. Uh, have, have you made some tests with, uh, um, in which the mesh is not uniform, like for like highly unstructured uh, problems? Uh, this was the reason for which I was uh, telling you to use the to use the matching, the coarsening based on the matching, because for those type of uh, for those type of grids, it usually works way better than the than the one based on the Vanek Brezina Mandel aggregation. Uh, so we have done some of the, let's say, classical uh, examples. I, we have not tried crazy, crazy stuff like fracture problems uh, with uh, highly jumping coefficients. That's something we actually, I, I don't think we have yet tried, but if you have something in mind, uh, I, I, I was, I was, I was more, yeah, we, we should probably talk in the, in the near future because I'm working in a version of Powerflow that, that, uh, that, that we use locally refined meshes and, 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 and the current preconditioners won't work on that case. Uh, that's reasonable because uh, the current preconditioner does use something that works with length of connection. So in a way, uh, it does suffer from the same uh, difficulties that the Vanek Brezina Mandel uh, version uh, implements. So I, it's it's reasonable that that's something that does that happens. Fabio. Yeah. Can I add one uh, comment? Sure. Uh, the the difficulty with the, the uh, with the refined mesh, uh, you can state the difficulty in uh, two or in in two or three aspects. So you have on the one hand you have support for of the data structures. That is not an issue at all. All of our data structures are perfectly capable of handling, uh, all of the underlying data structures are perfectly capable of handling the refined meshes. The second issue is how to handle the uh, load balancing. And that is something that we cannot solve on our own because we have to, uh, shall we say, uh, reach an agreement or a compromise with the application writer. There has to be a way to, to exchange data on that. And then there is the third aspect, which is the one Fabio was referring to of the efficiency of the uh, aggregation on uh, a, a grids with uh, local refinements, which is yet another kind of difficulty. So you have these three different kinds of difficulty uh, that require work in a slightly different areas of the library. Uh, the one, the, the, the library itself is basically uh, working, although you could argue that we uh, might develop some extensions in the future if there is sufficient interest, we may look at extensions, uh, specific extensions for multi-resolution uh, and, and uh, refined grids, but it does already work. Then you, we have to look at the interface for the load balancing, and that's a different question. And then there is the uh, the, uh, the algebraic uh, multigrid aggregation procedure, which is yet another topic, uh, which is not separated from the other two, but still it is essential for the overall performance of your method. I hope this clarifies things a little bit. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, if there is no more question, uh, we will end this session.
So first, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Fabio and Salvatore, for these two presentations. And um, I just want to add that, uh, yes, first, uh, Fabio, if you want, you can send me your presentation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will upload it on, on the website. And I will send an email to all attendees uh, about it, where to find uh, the file and so on. So thank you again and have a good end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. Attends, j'arrête l'enregistrement.